Good evening. Welcome to the March 9th, 2016 Zoning Board of Appeals. Uh, stand for the Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. I think we have a roll call. Mr. Hebert? Present. Um, Mr. Richard? Present. Mr. Crockett? Mr. Sh um, sorry, Ms. Shoup? Present. Mr. Stark? Mr. Maroon? Here. And Mr. Blaze? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, the agenda needs to be switched around a little bit, just to let everybody know. Uh, first uh, of all, uh, per the uh, comments from the uh, Code Enforcement Officer, will reverse 2568, put that into second position, and 2567 will become after that. Uh, 2566 will stay in the same place, but we do want to uh, also uh, add another item to the agenda, which would be uh, recognizing uh, Mr. Loisel for his chairmanship and time on the board, and uh, he's here today. What I'd like to do is, is welcome him as a, a regular citizen again. <laughs> and uh, thank him for the fantastic job he did as chairman. And uh, we've got a to come forward, sir. Take podium, Mr. Chair. Yes, you can welcome take podium if you say. So whatever you want, you can say. No, he was waiting for you to go present. Oh, I'll bring you over. Here. So, oh, why don't I come up to you? So here we have on this day, we've got an appreciation for your service to the town of Scarborough Board of Appeals Chair 2014. He's been on the board since 2006, by the way, and. Very, very, very knowledgeable board member. Unbelievable that value. Um, Rick, as Thank a friend. You. Thank you. Uh, I believe this goes with the key to the city, right? And, uh, <laughs> yeah, we have a combination code. All right. So we'll give you a number later. <laughs> Thank you. Good luck to everybody in the board. This has been a historic um, week. Peyton Manning retired, and so did you. Ah, uh, the difference is you got a plaque. <laughs> <laughs> But honestly, for everybody that just pays attention, this is a, anybody that does anything to the town with the town, they don't get paid. They do it because they choose to, because they love the town, and they want to make a difference. And Rick is a, the epitome of that. Uh, he was driving from Wood, Woodland? Woodland, which is a two and a half hour drive, four. Three, three and three. Well, it's anyway I drive. It's about two and a half when I drive. It's four <laughs> when he drove um, to come to meetings. That's how dedicated he was. And uh, he chaired a uh, fantastic chairman and fantastic as far as his depth of knowledge and uh, brought a lot to the table, as has many of the members over the years. Thank you, sir. You can go home, as I promised you. Excellent. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I finished painting the ceiling I was working on. <laughs> Thank you, Rick. Thanks, Thanks guys. Take Thanks, care, Rick. Rick. Good luck. Okay. So if we get back uh, to the... Um, approval of the minutes for January 13th. Do I have a motion? Motion to approve. Minutes. Second. And discussion on the motion. Seeing none, all in favor? That's three. Is the, uh, you don't have to oppose it. You can actually. You can actually. Oh, I wasn't saying. You can actually. Either way. Okay, that takes care of that. Let's jump right into appeal number 2566. It's a variance appeal by Beth Schisler. 48 Bayview Avenue, such as map U1, parcel 107, <coughs> and. I, I just uh, told Mr. Longstaff about what I thought of his comments on this appeal, and uh, I appreciate the work your team, you and your team, the, the just the, the way you translated it to English, because it's an interesting appeal. Thank you. What did I say? <laughs> well, actually, you said. <laughs> <laughs> um, did you want to uh, recognize voting members? Yeah. Oh yes, that's true. Uh, both yourself. You'll be voting members. We'll have four, one, two, three, four, five. So everybody will be voting today. So I'll just make sure you're aware of that. Um, the model is typically just uh, for you, Karen. Anybody on the board, alternate or not, uh, we look forward to speak, speaking, asking questions, uh, looking for answers. We also expect you to vote, even if you're only an alternate time. Even though your vote doesn't count, it gets the rhythm, it gets you used to the practice, and makes it a little bit easier long term. But tonight, <coughs> you're actually voting for real. And uh, to okay. jump right in, okay? You got it. All right. Hey, my Peter. 
Mr. Chairman, members of the board, I'm Jim Fisher with Northeast Civil Solutions here this evening representing uh, Ms. Beth Schistler, who is with us this evening. And also joining us is uh, the architect uh, who designed this uh, very cool looking house, or will be a cool looking house. That's Robin Tannenbaum. So um, I'll, in the interest of brevity, I'll try to keep my little presentation very short. But if you do have any architectural um, questions, then Robin will certainly uh, be free to come up here. And then obviously, if you have any specific questions of Ms. Schistler, she'll also be able to uh, answer those. Uh, first, I'd like to say I, I did a quick comment with Brian earlier. No meeting last month, and you haven't seen me in a, several months. So obviously, the form-based code for Higgins Beach, anyway, is working the way it was intended. So <laughs> very cool. Um, it's nice to be able to, uh, to know that something is uh, working quite well from the get-go. However, it doesn't apply uniformly to all projects. And one of the reasons that we're here this evening is that uh, we have a request somewhat similar to the request that uh, brought myself and others before you in the past, especially regarding Higgins Beach. Um, the form-based code, essentially, as you're well aware, uh, essentially is written toward <coughs> lots that are relatively uniform at around 50 by 100, thereabouts. Um, there's obviously flexibility down there, but most of those lots pretty much are that way. Um, there are several notable exceptions. This is one of them. This is actually less than half of that. It's essentially 50 by 50, not quite. Uh, essentially, what we're looking at is a 49 plus by 49 plus lot that doesn't give us very much square footage. The overall square footage of the lot, in fact, is actually smaller than many people, the footprint of many people's houses. Um, but in this particular case, and given much of what's going on at Higgins Beach, the houses are smaller. And uh, what we have here is a house that uh, has been in existence now for well over a half a century on a lot that was uh, created as part of a development over a century ago. And uh, Beth would like to be able to remodel it, primarily because, and the impetus for it, is the flood zone. Uh, with FEMA in changing the flood zones, we know it's not yet official, but it's going to be. I've uh, been working on that for many, many years. Uh, what we're trying to do now is uh, encourage anybody who is going to be working in the beach areas, whether it's Higgins Beach, Pine Point, Scarborough Beach area, et cetera, to take that into consideration, that meaning the flood hazards, when they are uh, looking at remodeling or rebuilding their house, if it's anything relatively substantial. Uh, and what that means is because even though this is outside of the shoreland zone, uh, and I do want to reiterate that it's not in the shoreland zone, but it is in a flood zone. Uh, as those flood zones expand and the erosion hazard areas expand, et cetera, when we're doing and looking at a major reno fairly major renovation, uh, we really need to try to be proactive and raise those houses up, or in this case, raise the cottage up, uh, which means on piles. Because it's in the erosion hazard area, the uh, free movement of wind, sand, and water really needs to be, to be able to minimize impact as far as flood hazard is concerned, needs to be able to flow through those foundations as opposed to a foundation that would actually stop it, cause a backup of hydrostatic pressure, and then uh, potentially do some damage to those structures that way. So Beth is being very proactive toward this end. We do have a, a cottage that looks nice. It's, it's pretty stark but uh, as far as its aesthetics are concerned, but it otherwise looks nice. Um, it was uh, recent, somewhat recently re-roofed within the past half a dozen years. Um, it's got some uh, relatively new siding on it. That is sort of masking an issue with many of the houses down in that area, and this one in particular, uh, with issues that you can't really see as far as support is concerned. We're not here to argue that point by any means, just kind of present it. We've already decided that the most prudent thing to do in conjunction with this remodeling is literally raise up the structure anyway put those uh, helical piles or whatever the piles are going to be underneath it and then uh, lower the structure back onto that in conjunction with the remodeling. The reason we're here as far as a hardship variance is concerned is because of the size of the lot relative to the um, small house but still large as far as the lot is concerned that sits on this property. And what Beth would like to do, and I'm going to call your attention to your packets as far as the architecturals or just right here, uh, which is the same design that you've got. Essentially what we're looking at is a house that looks like this now and is proposed to look like this one. And the difference is right now the house has, and you can see the photographs that I passed out to you earlier, the second photograph shows you this little infill area where the propane tanks are located. In conjunction with remodeling the house, this little area right in here was added on long after the original cottage was created. So it's a great addition to the inside of the house, but from the outside when you go to raise this house up, that thing's going to fall off. So in conjunction with remodeling the house, what we're proposing to do is, because this is very close to the back line, is actually uh, remove this, albeit temporarily, uh, and rebuild it when the house is remodeled and, and placed lowered back on its uh, piles that will actually 
increase the setback from the rear line so we will not be as non-conforming as we are now, um, albeit slightly, but it's a big step in the right direction. And toward that end, what we'd like to do is just square this off a little bit. It's only about a four by six area, uh, so it doesn't encompass a whole lot, but it doesn't meet the code uh, as far as setbacks are concerned. That code now is 30 feet from the rear. Well, 30 feet, when you, when you put the front and the rear setbacks under normal situations, uh, together we've got a building envelope that's literally two feet wide or two feet deep uh, by the, uh, about 34 feet wide. Um, so you can't get a house or a shed or anything in that uh, zone. So when we want to do anything to the house, we have to come here. Uh, sides are not an issue. Uh, the side setbacks are fine. But uh, in order just to be able to infill this particular area, um, and then we also have a, a request I'll get to just in a moment for a, uh, a land, an extended landing that's going to go across the front. But this is why we're here this evening, uh, asking for this particular variance again because well, we don't meet the exact setbacks because nobody could meet those setbacks. So it's more of a formality, but this is where we are. So I'm just going to show you a little bit about what the lot looks like. <coughs> you can see from the survey that uh, the lot is relatively small and the house takes up the vast majority of it. And you can see the lots on either side. Here's one lot literally on one side and then the abutting lot on the other side. Uh, so it fits, the lot fits very nicely character-wise into the neighborhood as far as its literally immediate abutters are concerned. It's just a small lot. Um, now, because the, we're in the floodplain, we're here for a hardship variance as opposed to practical difficulty, again, even though we're outside of the shoreland zone. And what we have is what we've always had, and that is, you know, a bit of a question on that, that first question, reasonable return. How do we actually get through, you know, a reasonable return when some people have said, well, you can have a vacant lot and put Adirondack chairs out there and you've got some type of return. In this particular case, uh, this building needs to be repaired, remodeled, redone badly. Uh, the foundation, which is going to go away anyway, it's a frost wall foundation right now, um, is actually in such poor shape, and Beth can tell you, and, and as well as Robin, that uh, the house is slanting. So it needs to be repaired regardless. And again, rather than just try to repair it, albeit minimally, let's do the right thing, put it up on piles, rebuild it, make sure that it's up to current code, uh, and we've got a strong house in which Beth can live for the rest of her time here. This is her only residence, her principal residence here in Scarborough. This is where she lives year round. Uh, and toward that end, she's looking to be able to uh, remodel this to make it considerably more livable than it is right now. Uh, I did speak with Brian a little bit earlier. I am going to refer to um, minorly a, um, an inspection report which you do not have in your packets. It's six pages long, which is why I didn't want to put that in there. Uh, but I will um, submit that to Brian for the record. What I will tell you is that the, uh, the inspector went, as they typically do, go all through the houses, and in particular the foundation, which is more our forte than anything else, uh, the inspector indicated that this needs to be replaced. So it is. Uh, but in conjunction with that, uh, we want to... Just stop you one second, who, is the in who did the inspection? Um, Brian Rollins. That just helps me. I, I know him. So okay. okay. Thank you. Um, and, uh, and I do have that information for you as far as that, uh, that report is concerned. Um, that in and of itself isn't a big deal because we're getting rid of the foundation uh, and putting up on piles. So uh, coming back to the, uh, the need for the variance, um, when we're looking at uh, reasonable return, you know, if this were a tiny little fisherman's cottage, you'd probably have a, a reasonable return. As a principal residence, given the way it, it's conditioned right now, uh, there's not only a, not a reason, in my opinion, not only a, not a reasonable return, there's virtually no return without putting a lot of effort and money into the house. Toward that end, since we are uh, very close to the back line but getting further away from it with what we propose, uh, we believe that the reasonable return would be met as far as it being the principal house. Now the other part of this, in addition to the small infill area, is an extended landing, a uh, proposal for an extended landing that goes across the front of the uh, house. Um, much to Robin's credit, uh, the architect's credit, uh, taking a look at the form-based code, while we are limited because of the position of the house and the size of the lot, et cetera, we're trying to conform as much as possible to the intent of that code, which is, in essence, to be able to create additional fenestration on a house, break up the facade, in other words. Now, you can see in the picture that you've got um, it's not a bad looking house, it's just really plain and stark and it's got a two story face to it that just has a tiny little step on the front and that's it. So what we propose is to be able to extend the landing that's going to also like make it a lot easier seasonally 
while this winter wasn't too bad, we all remember last year, which was a killer, uh, six feet of snow on the ground almost at this time still. And uh, by elevating this landing, uh, Mrs. Lizer uh, Liz on her own, and she's going to be, it's just a lot easier to be able to take that snow directly from the driveway as opposed to trying to kick it up over your heels or over your head. Uh, as long as that goes into the intent of the code, which was to break up the facade of a house, not with a full porch, it'd be great to have that, but then we'd be right on top of the right of way. All we'd like to do is be able to extend the, uh, the landing uh, over to the driveway right now uh, and have that be part of the, uh, the variance as far as the uh, unique circumstances of the property as well. So given that, uh, spoken enough, I'd be happy to answer any questions, address any comments that you have. And again, if it's architectural in nature, Robin will certainly come up and address it. And if you've got any specific questions uh, of Ms. Schistler, she'll be here as well. Oh, the board uh, questions. Next question. I'll just ask it again and add one, please. Um, <clears throat> the only thing I would add, I think, and um, Jim can probably clarify, I believe that um, one of the reasons for the proposed landing extension on the front of the house as opposed <coughs> to a front porch was also that a deck really was all that DEP would allow in the dune because they consider that um, able to, to um, transfer the sand in, in the dune action and it's not a structure because it doesn't have a roof on it. So that's, that's correct. That's a criteria of DEPs more than anything. If, if it weren't for that, then the applicant certainly could come and, and ask for relief for a full, uh, you know, covered porch as opposed to an open platform. So just, just getting back to the form-based code, the form-based code would rather see a porch. She can't do that. <laughs> right. that's, that's why that is the way it is, I think maybe the, the, the biggest reason that is the way it is. Yes, thank you. I appreciate that. And by the way, you do have in your packets the, uh, the approved DEP permit by rule for this project. So they have taken a look at it, they have reviewed it, and they have approved it. And is the landing making it more non-conforming? No, um, the landing is, uh, the, the landing that's there now and the steps to, to it are actually going to be uh, rotated 90 degrees. So given it's only steps, but the, by getting rid of the steps that are coming toward the front of the house and actually reorienting that toward the driveway, we're actually decreasing that. But from the landing's perspective, because the house is slightly angled to the lot, the extent of the landing that sticks out right now, it's going to be about an extra half a foot uh, closer to the overall road, but it's going to be about a foot and a half less close to the front right away because of the reorientation re of that landing and the steps going to the driveway as opposed to heading straight out to the road. That's Graphically, that um, this section right here has actually got the steps that come down to the road, to the front property line. Over here, we're going to be reorienting that and turning it so it actually comes out this direction. Mr. Longstaff, could you help me with a little bit of a understanding of the the, the shoreline rules? Mm -hmm. You'd said that the deck could not, you could not put a, a roof over that because that affected the that was a DEP item. That's DEP, not Shoreland. That, that's that's the Dune Regulations chapter. Can you explain how that works to me? Because I don't understand how. I, I wish I could, that. but unfortunately, <laughs> I don't pretend to understand the Dune Regulations. Um, I thought I did. <laughs> I was I was informed that I did not understand them. <laughs> we attempted to try to capsulize it in our Higgins Beach Ordinance. If you recall, there was yeah. sort of a matrix. Um, DEP got a hold of that. We uh, we thought they'd already vetted. It had already been vetted through them, but they said that's all wrong. You could you should just take that out, and just leave the top line that says "Call DEP." <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so basically, let me make sure I get this right. Yeah. The roof, as opposed to the deck, could affect the flooding. No, 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 no. It has <laughs> nothing to do with flooding. Okay. There are two things at work here. It's in the it's in the frontal no it's no. in the erosion hazard area correct it's in the erosion hazard area okay that's not floodplain okay that's dune stuff okay <laughs> floodplain is a completely <coughs> different animal and and I just enlighten uh, you a little bit about the floodplain issue um, Ms. Schisler is actually um, proposing to elevate the structure one foot above sort of proposed base flood, the new base flood elevation, not the existing base flood when elevation. It might come we up. know that there's going to be a map change some year, we think, maybe by 2017. Maybe. And so since she's sinking uh, or proposing to sink a substantial amount of money and effort into this structure, 
it would only make sense to kind of plan while she knows she's got to elevate it, why not elevate it to what we believe will probably be the new base flood elevation. I can't say with any, uh, with 100% certainty that it will be, but I don't believe you're going to see a lot of change in that. It won't go down. It won't go down. Uh, right. It certainly won't go down. And, and so there is a benefit for every foot above base flood that you elevate. You don't have to be just one foot above, but as long as you're not exceeding building height, which she's not, um, that's that's what she's proposing to do. I just wanted to clarify that too. It's not the existing base flood that she's elevating to, it's the proposed, which makes good sense if you can do it. If you're in the middle of a project, you might as well raise it for what's, what it's going to be, not what it is currently. And there's quite a difference between the current base flood and the proposed, so. And now you know why I said at the beginning, thank you very much for the very good letter because there are Four, four layers that we're dealing with in this appeal, <coughs> and uh, so I said, make, condensed it down to one and a half pages, one and a quarter pages, for me to be able to understand. And that's and to answer your original question, I can't remember the exact reason why they don't allow roofs over. It, but maybe uh, Robin can. Yeah, please. Yep. Migration. Of <coughs> This one? There you go. Uh, okay. I'm Robin Tannenbaum from Kaplan Thompson Architects. Uh, my understanding, and I too, it's been a learning curve with all these different layers, is it's not so much allowing as once you put a roof over it, it becomes, the, the term is, it's not the impervious, but it becomes, it counts as square foot of building. And so she would have to remove other square foot of building in order to do it. It's already existing as conditioned space. Okay. So she wouldn't be allowed to, to have both. As opposed to the rule regarding patio versus deck? Yes, because I think because that's porous, it's not considered footprint. It's my understanding from Coastal DG. Sounds good to me. Yeah, yeah I, there, there's, there's a couple of caveats in the it's, Chapter it's 3. It's open and not open. I mean, we would love, even on, on the back deck that we have to her sort of mudroom door, it's not as covered overhead as one would like when one's doing their house, but we can't. We're t our hands are tied on that. So it's unfortunate. Um, we did the best we could, but it's, um, it's as much as we're allowed right now. Thank you. So, yeah. uh, are the board member questions, comments? If not, I'll open the public hearing if anybody would like to speak from the public. I want to open the public hearing. And if you could state your name and address, that would be great. Yep, I'm Margaret Donovan. I'm at 50 Bayview, right beside her. I took a house similar to what she has there and remodeled it. I know how bad it is under that vinyl, and it really needs help. <laughs> so, and it's going to be great to have someone here around that actually loves the ocean, too. And that's what her intent is. So I support her improving that property 100%. Thank you, Ms. Donovan. Appreciate it. Anybody else wish to speak? Okay, seeing no one else wishing to speak, I'll close the public hearing part of this meeting. And we go to the requirements of the uh, variance appeal. And again, that's the most difficult of our appeals. But if you'd like to start, Mr. Thank Fisher, you. we'll go with you. Uh, the first question, the landing question cannot yield a reasonable return, et cetera. Uh, in order to be proactive, as we just discussed, uh, relative to FEMA's flood hazard designations in the Higgins Beach area, which will eventually come here soon. It's been the same I information for a couple of years, and it just is remaining to be uh, put into place. Uh, the entire house is going to have to be raised and placed on the pile foundation. That house will need to be re extensively remodeled in order to do so. And in doing so, a portion of the house will be removed, which is approximately 34, uh, 32 square feet at the back of that house right now, uh, and replaced with an infill the northwesterly corner of the house at 29 square feet. This reduces the existing nonconformity by two feet, which means that the rear of the house will be two feet further away from the property line than the current house. Also, the elevated walkway would be uh, extended across the front of the house from the current porch to the driveway. As far as reasonable return, given that this is a permanent house and a very modest house at that, we believe that that uh, reasonable return criteria would be met. Thank you. The need for the variance uh, due to the unique circumstance of the property. Uh, the need for the variance is solely due to the unique, unique circumstance of the property, uh, it being an exceptionally small lot at 2,490 square feet. 
because of zoning setbacks relative to lot size that were enacted afterwards, uh, the building envelope on the lot is literally two feet deep by 30 feet long, 34 feet long wide, uh, and thus could not support a structure of any kind, let alone a full house. Number three, the granting of the variance would not alter the essential character of the neighborhood. Uh, the overall remodeled structure will be almost the same as what you currently see, albeit augmented with the fenestration that we uh, um, propose uh, relative to what currently exists, including its height. The essential character of the neighborhood will not be altered <coughs> negatively. In fact, um, as we just heard, it will very likely enhance the character <coughs> of the neighborhood by taking an otherwise relatively modest house and uh, minorly but significantly dressing it up a bit. And then finally, the, the hardship is not the result of action taken by the applicant or a prior owner. Uh, the lot in the existing house predate zoning. The lot was created in 1897 as part of one uh, development. And then the house, uh, according to municipal records, was constructed in 1946. And the issue of the hardship is thus the result of the enactment of zoning long after the lot was created and the house was actually constructed. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this requires a, a conversation on each one of these items. And I'd like to make those conversations as part of the uh, facts. And then we'll come back and summarize whichever way that the board chooses to go from there uh, for, the, for, the record, for the record's sake, okay? Um, as far as number one, uh, reasonable return, I had the opportunity while I was, in, I was actually in Florida this week and I had the opportunity to talk to some people down there uh, regarding flood zones and regarding typical zoning and how it varies from state to state and part of the world. And the issue of, you know, how do you deal with variance and, the, and each state has different rules, but the net result is how do you deal with something like criteria that has no reasonable return? And they gave me the best answer I think I've ever heard. If in fact you're dealing with a flood zone, you're saying by not allowing the property to be raised, that is going to get totaled at some point within 100 years, which by default would make it a, uh, a justification for reasonable return. Which whether or not we agree with that argument, it was fascinating and it was simple. Now granted, they get flooded out every other year. So they deal with it a lot more than we do, but it was amazing the number of lots I saw in, uh, actually in uh, uh, Cape Coral that were vacant and they were vacant because of the storms, and I was wondering whether or not you could rebuild. And uh, the argument was you can if you follow the, the appropriate codes, but one of the arguments was can you get by that by saying uh, that by meeting the, the requirement of raising it, you bring you a reasonable return, which I'd never heard before. Uh, that I'm not saying that w is what we should do, but uh, I found it enough that I found it intriguing enough that I certainly would add it to my repertoire of reasons. And I, I think it does meet that um, that requirement along with I take the word of the, the construction as far as that's concerned. And I do know the, uh, the person that did the building inspection. So I'll, I'll take that on that. Are the board members with thoughts, questions on that issue? That is one of the most difficult on a variance appeal. It is, and I think about that a lot. I I agree with that argument too, Mark. I think that's a good point. I also, when I, when I see this argument for this home, I. I think it boils down to that. It's, 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 you know, this woman just wants a home to live that's safe, that's going to be there for years to come, and this is really the only vehicle to do. And I think that's well within reason. I do, and I, and I think if we weren't allowed it, it wouldn't yield a reasonable return. That's how I feel about that first question. You know what I mean, Mr. Fisher? Do you have a copy of the inspection? I do. <coughs> Can I look at that? You certainly may. See this as we go along. We'll just pass it down. I guess. Yeah. To, to me, there's enough weight that I'm okay with it. But I respect anybody that wants to read it first. Um, other comments regarding uh, when? Why don't we start right down at, at this camera? We're gonna put you right on the spot right off the bat. <laughs> uh, the requirement for reasonable return uh, is not maximum return, but rather, uh, and it's it, if you haven't been to a 
one of the training programs that the state runs, these are virtually almost impossible to meet those requirements. Almost impossible. But there are times when it does. I think this house meets that. Um, for the reasons that, that I stated also because um, we know a lot of those, a lot about those houses down there. And if you're going to remodel it, once you hit the 50% threshold, you've got no choice but to come to us in this case. And it doesn't take much to get the 50% of the cost. So what I'd like you to do is, is respond to how you feel about that. And if you don't have questions, feel, feel free to ask Mr. Longstaff or anybody else. But we'll let you jump right in. In regards to reasonable return? Yes. Well, I used to be a realtor. So I'm very familiar with a reasonable return, and um, so I totally understand, you know, what you want to do with the property and make it more value, and yes, it totally does increase the value of the properties around it, and um, it sort of sets a standard for other people to maybe, um, it's, it's a beautiful design, and um, so I think it fits very well, as the zoning board has said in their review of it, that it fits well with kind of what their uh, idea with the future of Higgins Beach is. Yeah. I guess, uh, <coughs> excuse me, my interpretation of this as well uh, aligns with yours, Mark. Um, in coming at it from more of an engineering standpoint, if the house is already slanting um, and the potential for, you know, the 100-year flood is, is always certainly there um, by raising the structure and then maintaining the uh, original height of the structure from the original structure. Um, really does go a long way. And, and my comments sort of touch upon all four of these that don't mean to, but, uh, uh, you know, why apply a Band-Aid to the situation where if you're going to be redoing this with um, the minimal effect to the nonconformity issues of this project, um, why not just do it and, and go all the way with it? So I, uh, I don't really see, I, I see this as sort of a, one of the one of the better explanations or, or better arguments for the reasonable return in this case. Thank you. I, yeah, I, I agree. I, I don't think that approaching it any other way than the way she's chosen is, is the right way to do it to provide a, a house that's safe and there for years to come. Thank you. Mr. Crocker, do you have enough time to, to look at that or do you need more time? Yeah, I, I think we should. I mean, it would be my suggestion that we put this in as part public of public record and, and the finding of facts. There's, there's some features in here for one, there's, there's high level of radon in the house. Um, asbestos, there wasn't asbestos, any asbestos used, but there is notating of potential lead paint. I'm sure when they renovate, they may be moving that out of there. Um, there's mold in the sheetrock in the basements and attic. And so you've got white mold there, water in the crawl spaces. Because um, normally I wouldn't vote yes that it doesn't that it meets this question, but just looking through here, I mean, there's water lines on rigid insulation that indicate about eight inches of water standing along the walls and more near the center, and it's just there's several things in here that are notated by the inspector that are unsafe. So I need to capsulize that well. Thank you. <laughs> with that being said, I think we should put this in the record as finding the fact as well because it notates a lot of information that I normally wouldn't be okay with for reasonable return. So we'll make that as part of the record and part of your comments. Okay, so as far as the first requirement, which is the reasonable return, um, I uh, agree again, I'll come back to what I said, I think and now, especially with your comments tied to that, that <coughs> it, it does meet that, it does meet the standard of, of a and so I'll be voting yes for that item. So I'd like to take a position as we vote on each one of these. Uh, uh, do I have a, I'll put a motion out that we approve the plan, section one of this, just the reasonable return part. So all in favor of section one being met. That's unanimous on section one, meaning the, the variance uh, regarding the hardship. Normally I wouldn't be, but thank you for providing me additional information. It's helpful because if something's unsafe, that makes the decision a little bit easier, and the fact that you're bringing it back into setbacks, and you're also um, doing some things to raise it up above the floodplain, which is coming. So there's a lot of preemptive strikes here, which is good. Thank you. And number two is the need for variances due to the unique circumstance of the property. Um, this criterion, again, applies to the property, not the people. And uh, so, again, why don't we give 
Karen Brick will start down at this end <laughs> with you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it is what it is down there. The, <laughs> the lots are all very unique, and we've addressed it. We've, we've looked at things to be done, so... I mean, it is kind of a plain, basic house. It's, it's livable, but it does need some... I agree completely with that. Not much to add. Okay. Anything to say? That encapsulates what I would say. No, I agree. I mean, you're doing the best you can with what you got. <laughs> uh, I would say that um, as far as the neighborhood, I, I appreciate the comments from uh, the neighbors. I think that's important. I look at the map, and uh, it's obvious that it is very tiny uh, compared to properties. I love the fact that it's not expanding. I think that's great, which is consistent with what the board has taken overall and uh, the work that went in. I think the architect, by the way, uh, was... I loved what you did with the plan internally. I think you did a fantastic job with, with that layout. I thought that I was amazed that uh, it laid out as you get three bedrooms in there. Um, and, uh, so I think you did a great job with that design. It seems very functional. And uh, the previous design had some functional obsolescence, which I think also helps. So I have, uh, it is absolutely the property, so I have no problem with that. So again, I'll take a mo uh, all in favor of the uh, property meeting the requirement for unique circumstance of the property. I approve, yes, all approved. So that's unanimous on number two. Number three is the granting of the variance will not alter the essential character of the neighborhood. I don't think we have to waste a lot of time on that. I think it's pretty straightforward. It's actually only, it's consistent with what the new plans are. So, if anything, it's bringing it more in compliance with the new plans and actually the vision of the of the work that was done. And I think it looks very attractive. I don't totally understand the roof concept. But that's okay. Um, so, I have no problem with supporting um, three. Um, like you said before, Mr. Chairman, it's it's nice that we have a neighbor that's coming forward that is encouraging it to be done to help with the neighborhood. So. That's always a positive for us when we're looking at these things. And Ms. Donovan, that really does make a difference. Thanks for taking the time. Well, my house was very similar to Parkwood. I think you were on the board when I came. <laughs> 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 and I'll tell you, my computer was over. It really interested. Thank he you. was 18 when he started on the board. I <laughs> 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 I mean, it just enhances the surrounding uh, lots in the neighborhood and only increases the value, which, and also looking at the design, it, it, it's very close to what was there originally as far as aesthetics, and uh, it really, uh, it works. I have no issues with this. Great. Thank you. Issue? Oh, no, I think it's a nice kind of step in the future of what Higgins Beach will be someday. Okay, so I have a motion on number three. Well, I'll just move it anyway. So i all in favor of number three taking uh, being met. It's unanimous. And the final item is uh, the hardship is not a result of the action taken by the applicant or prior owner. I, I did get a chuckle of, out of, uh, and I got a pick on Mr. Longstaff for this allegedly thing. Um, <laughs> I love the word. The allegedly was built in 1946. Right. It's I said allegedly because I didn't check the facts. <laughs> it just seemed like one of those political words. You know, I just enjoyed it. I thought that was kind of good. So anyways, and, and i got to tell you, the strongest reason, honestly, what made this very easy for me to grab a hold of and get the concept of was the work that the, the towns, uh, which Mr. Longstaff did, on just defining all the loose ends that, if left to our own device, uh, could have taken weeks to go through, whereas I think he summarized that very well, and I think Mr. Fisher did a good job of that, too. Uh, again, I think uh, on that issue, number four, I lost it. But, uh, thank you. It, the result of the action taken by uh, prior owner, or it, it's irrelevant on this issue, I think. It certainly wasn't, nothing's been done since 79. Other comments from the board? Okay, and then vote on number four. All in favor? That's unanimous. So now that we have a motion on the entire appeal. I'd like to make a motion to approve appeal number 2566. Second. And discussion on the motion. 
seeing none, all in favor? That's unanimous. Thank you very much. Good luck. Thanks for your time. You're welcome. Okay. That's great to hear. And, and Ms. Longstaff's nice. Just in case it didn't come across, she, she had thanked Ms. Longstaff for his patience. Uh, it's great to have Ms. Longstaff here. I think he does a fantastic job. Please stop it. So, make it congratulations on the fix. I love your design. Uh, I think it was very, very tasteful, creative. Sure. You're welcome. Very glad for you. Not yet. Congratulations. Good luck. Yeah. Mr. Fisher, not to leave you out, as always. Good luck. You're welcome. Yes, you are. And as I pointed out uh, regarding the next appeal, and we'll just take a second here, but are we switching the order? Uh, because the first, the second appeal is actually a variance appeal. If the variance doesn't go through, the other one becomes kind of useless. So we might as well go first with variance and then deal with the, uh, the second part. So that's the logic behind that. I find my black pack in Told him you weren't coming back. He was thinking I wasn't too. <laughs> I, got, I got some more. This is a grind of more of me. Who's Logan? Yes. I thought he should have you. There. Is Logan coming up there? Yeah. Oh, I didn't talk that minute. No. Oh, okay. Are you ready? No. It's all my I'm ready when you're ready. Oh, here it is. So, second appeal is appeal number. 2568. It's a variance appeal by Deborah T. Gates, trustee of the Deborah T. Gates Trust, 423 Black Point Road, Assessor's Map, R103, Parcel 11. And we have a representative. Thank you very much. If you could state your name, address, we'll go from there. Hi. Uh, my name is Marvin Gates. Um, my address is 241 West 113th Street. New York, New York, 10026. Um, this is my wife, Debbie, who's the appellant, I believe. <laughs> this is the architect, Ted Haffenreffer, and one of the abutters, Mr. Gray. Mr. Howard Gray has joined us as well. Um, I'm pleased that the gentleman who just made the last presentation isn't here because I can say that's a tough act to follow. <laughs> <laughs> um, at any rate, um, this is my first time doing anything like this. I, um, uh, I don't even know where to begin. Okay, I, we'll help you. Sure. Yeah. Number one, uh, the, the, this is a citizen board, as we said earlier at the beginning. Our goal is to work rather um, as best we can to help the community get the right answers. Sure. So uh, relax, and basically the goal is just to try and help the, the process through so that we're doing the right thing by the town and by the people that own the property. Completely understand. I, uh, uh, we bought the property in 2013. Um, prior to buying it, we, uh, I met with Mr. Longstaff a few times. Uh, we figured out some details as to the nuances of the property. Uh, and what I mean by that is, in every conceivable way, the property is non-conforming that we could figure out. Uh, the, and all the terms do not come to my ready attention, but uh, the distances from the side, the distances from the front, the uh, fact that it's a commercial property and rural farm. Um, and before I go much further, because uh, Brian Longstaff's minutes uh, that he uh, sent to you prior to the meeting, I don't know if the minutes, uh, refer to a structural engineer's report. And this is the report, and I'm going to be referring to it uh, throughout the uh, presentation. Thank you. So my only plan here is to uh, introduce
introduce ourselves, give you some background to us so it feels as though we're not total strangers, and then uh, proceed to read my answers to the variants. Uh, is that clear? Right? Is that fair enough? That's, that's exactly it. We'll talk okay. Um, the packet includes <coughs> photographs of uh, the drawings of Mr. Haffenreffers. Um, and uh, let me introduce ourselves, which to some degree is in the project description and circumstances as well. But um, my grandmother, uh, and that's grandmother, not great grandmother, uh, started coming to the area in the 1890s. Uh, my yes, I know. And uh, I'm my, the says older. <laughs> my, my grandmother and grandfather uh, uh, continued doing that after they were married and eventually bought a house uh, at Prout's Neck in the 1940s. Um, I grew up coming two months every summer uh, with the, my brothers and sisters and my parents to visit him. Uh, and uh, he, uh, that ended when I was about 13. He died. The property was sold. Um, I remember passing this every day and as you can imagine a young boy I'll just say eight nine ten years old this meant that we were just about there it was a uh, milestone landmark and um, fast forward I'm sure I'm leaving lots out but fast forward to 2013 the year we bought the property we were back up my siblings have continued going up uh, and renting uh, and one uh, built a piece of property on Um And we know uh, Debbie and I came up for a wedding of my brother's uh, daughter uh, and uh, noticed that what I call Harmons, but white caps, uh, was for sale. And I won't bore you with tons of more detail, but one thing led to another. And after conferring with the town about is this at all reasonable, possible even, to do with what we thought we might want to do with it, uh, we decided to buy it. And then uh, here we are. Uh, once again, have met with Mr. Longstaff and uh, conferred with him many, many times. Uh, as I said, uh, I sort of have the, the bad penny uh, way of showing up and discussing things over and over again. So, have I left anything out? Oh, yeah. My grandparents are buried at Black Point and, and in cemetery. And I feel, even though we're obviously not uh, here now, as though uh, I'm a part of the place. So, the good news is we don't hold we don't hold anything against New Yorkers. Uh, right, right, right. We don't right. like that Piant's cost, but besides <laughs> that, okay. Um, well, but and, the, and the Royals won the World Series this year. <laughs> so that <laughs> well, makes no difference where you're from. The yeah. bottom line is, that, uh, you know, we're glad that you're, you take an interest in the property, property, and. You're, Trying to do something with it. Well, um, let me start uh, by reading uh, A and B, if um, I may. If, Please. If, Excuse me. Um, if, if I could maybe just run down, just give us a brief elevator pitch on what you propose to do with the structure. Well, I was hoping I could read A and B to do that, but I. Uh, <laughs> well, if it, if it fits better that way, go ahead and do What it. we're proposing to do uh, from you know the higher view is <coughs> we want to keep as much. As again, it's a landmark. So we want to basically, as I say to people, if you were to blink, and it would be a long blink, um, with what we would do to it, you would think we have not changed anything here. It would still look the same. In the back, in the building, buildable envelope of the property, we would like to put a uh, small cottage. Uh, I mean, we're talking about the building envelope being 
550 square feet, roughly. Uh, we are coming up of uh, what the architect, Ted can uh, help me out here, but think of it as being a story and a half. The second story is dormered. So it remains to be not too high and feels low. Uh, we're bringing the setbacks into variants on the side. Uh, we are bringing the, it currently has more than 25% of the lot uh, covered with a building, so we're bringing that back into variance as well. Um, we are not going to, keep, obviously not going to keep it as a commercial property. Uh, it hasn't been a viable commercial property for a long time. Uh, as I state in the, in the, uh, in the application, uh, uh, it was on the market for many years. The neighbors weren't interested in it. Uh, we have a sentimental and historical attachment to it. And what we want to do is we want to have a small cottage in the back and in the front. I'm a, by training and profession, I'm a fine artist, a, a, um, a painter. And uh, in the front, where Harmon's white capped is, in the forehead, this gets into the second uh, application, but the, uh, the uh, open a small gallery, uh, home occupation gallery where I can show my work. And that's open to by appointment. It's not a high traffic area. It would be, if you were interested in what I was doing, please give me a call and, and let's set, set up an appointment and uh, come by and see. Again, 400 square feet, not huge, but uh, I would say, in essence, we're trying to make something that looks like a total wreck. And it, when we get to the uh, structural engineering report, which I definitely would like to read the summation for the record, uh, is uh, in imminent you know, state of collapse and make an attractive uh, scaled, so it doesn't appear to be overwhelming, uh, structure of uh, value to the to us, obviously, but that's not what we're here for. It's a value to the to the site and to the town and to the community, and uh, I hope that's not overstating it. That's good. I mean, uh, Mr. Longstaff, anything you would like to add to this? Um, now, uh, uh, Mr. Gates left out one thing after he first conferred with me, and we looked at the constraints on the lot. I told him not to buy it. He did. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to go on record, uh, but no, uh, we That's we. That's fine. I don't recall it that way, but I, I, I may have also mentioned that he might be crazy, but anyway. <laughs> um, but no, he he had a passion for it. We we looked at the the building, the existing building envelope, which you can see on uh, on the, uh, which is right here. This is the legal building envelope. Uh, so you, so the existing building had this little. It does have this little block wing on the side of it, which he's proposing to remove along with the rest of the structure. So that was the real non-conforming part of the, the building. Obviously, the front was also really non-conforming and close to the road with, with very little parking. So what you can see in the darker line weights here is what he's proposing to put. And so the dwelling is the, the, the part that's going to be their cottage dwelling is fitting into that tiny buildable envelope. And then the the other part of the structure, which is basically mirrors the existing structure, would be moved back from the road is, is what he's proposing, mm -hmm. and creating a little bit more space, a little bit more conforming setback, certainly not conforming, but with a lot that's, you know, barely, uh, uh, what is it? I forgot now. It's uh, 1,500 square feet. Is that what it's? Uh, the lot itself? Yeah. yeah. Uh, no, the lot is... Uh, not is roughly 5,400 square feet. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, it was, it's very small. <laughs> it's 60 by 90, and it's not a rectangle. It's a parallelogram, and uh, takes an artist to see something. There what you go. What Takes an artist to see something, doesn't it? Doesn't Thank it? you. Um, <laughs> just to sort of speed the process up a little bit. Sure. Um, why don't we go through the uh, uh, the criteria? Uh, why don't we open up the public hearing first? If anybody'd like to speak to the public. Does anybody want to speak on this issue? Feel free to take the microphone, Mr. Gray. Take your name, address. We'll go from there. Do you have any letters or phone calls? My name is Howard Gray. 
and we own the property behind this and on side of Mr. Gates. We have no objection whatsoever with it. Mr. Gates did say it's not going to be used commercially, and I would like to think that uh, he would not be using it as a rental unit down the line. I don't know if that can be put in there or not. I, I know we haven't talked about this, but otherwise in that, uh, my wife and I are very pleased that they're going to do something with it, and we look forward to it. Yeah. Thank you. Mr. Gray, so you know we can't put a restriction like that on it, but... Um, I'm sorry, I can't hear a word you're saying. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thanks. Right. So let's uh, go to the first criteria. Okay, well, Needle jumps out. The land in question cannot yield a reasonable return unless the variance is granted. And if you want to read in the record what you've got, that, that would be perfect. Thank you. Uh, and the reason why we use it, have you read in the record, is because that's the actual, that's the actual, the, the writing and documents aren't, the, the actual testimony is. Very good. Very good. I've, I've, I've looked at some of your videotapes and I appreciate the, that fact. The lot is very small. Five, 5,384 square feet. Its shape is a parallelogram. After the setbacks, 50 feet in the front and 15 feet on the sides and back, and with the common construction practice of building at right angles, the size of the building envelope is 584 square feet. That is the size of a small one-bedroom apartment. If this was beachfront property, maybe the land would make a nice picnic site. The property does not have that view. The property is too small for productive farming, and besides, the soil is sand. Neither a butter found it useful enough to purchase. For several years before its purchase by the applicant, the property was on the market. For an even longer period of time, the property had not operated as a viable commercial business. Without the variance, the land cannot yield a reasonable return. Okay, thank you. And the second one is the need to the variance is due to the unique circumstances of the property. The size of the property and its commercial use are the unique circumstances of the property. The lot, pardon me, the lots, the lot, original building and permitted use date to 1930, long before current zoning. Originally, the property operated as a fish market. Later, it expanded and was a general market. Always, it served the affluent neighborhood of Prout's Neck. The original owner's grandchildren told the representative, that's me, that their parents sold the property over 50 years ago because the business model was no longer viable. Each incarnation of the business since then has been less successful than the one before. For many years before the applicant purchased the property in 2013, very little business occurred. Here, its small size and commercial use are very uncommon conditions not shared by the neighborhood. The need for the variance is absolutely due to these unique circumstances. Thank you. And the granting of the variance will, will not result in a essential different character of the neighborhood. Thank you. The granting of the variance will enhance the neighborhood's essential character. In the accompanying photograph, uh, and the photographs you have in front of you, but I'm referring to the historical photographs. Pardon me. Um, in the accompanying photograph, please note that for over 80 years, the property has been interwoven with the neighborhood's essential character. The applicant wants to maintain that character. The result for the variance, the request for the variance, is linked hand in glove with a desire not to alter such character. The applicant wants a residence. In the front room, the applicant requests a home occupation, an art gallery. The applicant thinks that the affluent neighbors of Prout's Neck will enjoy such a home occupation. The front of the proposed building will appear unchanged. The applicant's husband, again, my wife, the applicant, me, the husband, spent summers at Proutsnack with his grandfather, a past president of the Proutsnack Country Club. His grandparents are buried in Black Point Cemetery. To, ha to enhance the character, we want to replace the current big plastic sign with a smaller historic Harmon's Market sign. This is nice touch, actually. Uh, number four is uh, the hardship is not a result of the action taken by the applicant or prior owner. And just for the record, on the issue of uh, purchasing, that's kind of been settled. Um, 
law as long as that sub case law that purchasing the property doesn't trigger that requirement. So even though they purchased the property knowing that it didn't meet current setbacks or regulations, that's been since there was a debate on that at one point, and that's been taken off the table. So that's no longer something you have to worry about. Yeah, that's an accurate statement. And the other thing to consider, too, is that the reason that this is a standard hardship variance is because the property is in the floodplain. Otherwise, it could be a practical difficulty variance with not quite as restrictive criteria to meet. Thank you. Well, that – oh, pardon me. Excuse me, Mr. Lynch. Yes, sir? It's in the standard floodplain, but is there a possibility of a letter of map amendment on this property? Has that been explored? It's possible. We don't have an elevation certificate on it, but I think if we look at the building plans, I believe Ted has some elevations on the finished floor. Mr. Evans, would you please take the microphone so we can just get your name and record and hear you on the tape? Thank you. I'm Ted Hoffman-Ruffer. I did the design of the house. The site plan that I referred to is Owen Haskell's boundary and topographic survey, and as part of the work that they did, they came up with a finished first floor level of 11.08, which is actually 11 foot 1 inch, and I believe 10 is floodplain, so it's a foot over floodplain, a base floodplain. The current base floodplain? Yes. Yes. Okay, thank you. And then there's another place in the back. It's 11.12, which is 11 foot 1 1⁄2 inches, so it's just over 1 foot over the existing floodplain, base floodplain. And what we intended to do is to raise it up an additional 8 inches to give it, to get it a little bit, just a little bit higher, but not so high that it began to get too high because it, you know, it would begin to lose some of its historic character at that point in time. Are you planning to do that based upon what we heard from the last applicant, anticipating that the floodplain is going to change? Is that why you're planning to raise it up that additional 8 inches? Partially, but we're not taking it up to the new standard. We're just raising it up an additional 8 inches above where it is right now, just to give us a margin of safety. Is there a reason why you wouldn't bring it up to the new standards like the last applicant is doing? The reason for that was really that in order to get it up that high, you'd see an awful lot of foundation and very, you know, very little, you know. I mean, it would begin to look like it was all foundation, sort of looking at the front of the building without being able to grade up to the building properly. And the site's so small that we really couldn't do that either. I'm sorry, I don't think you've read in the last one. The hardship is not resolved in action taken by the applicant or prior owner. If you could approach Mr. Gates, that would be great. Yeah, thanks. As described above, the hardship is due both to the property's very small size and limited use. The hardship was caused by imposition of buffer zones over the existing floodplain and also the existing floodplain was caused by imposition of buffer zones over the existing floodplain. The lot, the existing building, and the property's permitted use originated in 1930 and all predate the town zoning ordinance. Since purchasing the property in 2013, besides maintaining the property, the property owner has taken no action. Thank you very much. We've already opened the public hearing to this, so let's come back with questions, comments from the board. I have a question. So why did you discourage them from purchasing it? I was really only joking. I didn't discourage you from purchasing it. How long had it been on the market before you had purchased it? 
Oh, uh, you know, honestly, it's truth, truthfully, I don't know exactly. I think it had been on the market for... Two years? I believe two years, yeah. And there's probably not anything that we need to look at if, from Scarborough Historical. I doesn't have any... I get to be honest, I'm thrilled that... It, it's it's not, funny, it's, a, it's, it's not, not historical. Okay, that's yeah. what I wanted to say. But, yeah, good. I cut you off. Okay, that's all I wanted to say. Mr. Richard? A uh, couple of thoughts. Number one, I love the idea that you're trying to keep the uh, the flavor, with, especially putting the Harmons back up there. It's uh, fascinating. Uh, it's uh, rare. I, I find I grew up in the, the 70s when it was actually still being used on occasion. And it is a landmark. It truly is a, a, a quintessential part of, in my opinion, that road. And what's also very odd about it is it's it's kind of standalone, uh, and it's it's really steps up. So I, I think it, what you're doing is is a, personally, I, when I read this, I was thrilled uh, with what you're trying to do. I uh, I commend you, and I think the architect again, second architect, can take a very small space and use it very efficiently. Um, so I think that's, that's impressive too. And again, the neighbors, if that makes Mr. Gray coming out here is important. So. Again, just to tie all those things together, I and mean, the reason <coughs> I say this is for future p applicants, if you understand what works, as I understand you watch some of the tapes, there's a rhythm to this process, and, and following the rhythm to the process makes it a lot easier. That doesn't guarantee anything, but, but it certainly um, has a better flow, so just but for the record. I, I, I don't mean to interrupt, no, uh, but I do think it's important to enter uh, into the record, the um, the structural engineer's report, and I, I, again, uh, in layman's terms, what we're really talking about here is uh, approaching the plans uh, uh, practically, I suppose, and uh, and uh, so. Um, if I may uh, just read for the record the summary okay. of the structural engineer's report, I would very much appreciate it, it's, uh, as you have it in front of you. Um, and prior to doing, reading the last paragraph, I would just like to say that uh, in, uh, in number one, the existing floor system, his last couple of paragraphs there are the deterioration has compromised the integrity of the entire floor system. The portion of the floor at the rear of the building has been completely removed due to the severe deterioration that was discovered. The existing post pier supports beneath the floor beam have settled, are leaning, and are in imminent danger of collapse. As far as the roof structure, number two, the instability is hazardous condition is a hazardous condition which could potentially collapse when subjected to roof snow loads. Uh, number three, the exterior walls. The excessive movement that the building is experiencing increases the potential of structural collapse when the building is subjected to lateral wind, seismic loads, and roof snow load. Part of the building is uh, eight inch concrete masonry block. His conclusion there was However, there are cracks in the masonry at every corner of the building, hence the masonry walls are experiencing movement due to frost heave and or settlement, which is compromising the existing exterior concrete masonry block walls and foundation primarily at the corners of the building. And finally, thank you for letting me read those, the conclusion. The existing building structure is in extremely poor condition and in a severe state of disrepair. The building is in imminent danger of collapse and unsafe to occupy due to the movement, deterioration, instability, and lack of capacity of the existing structural components. And finally, and to some degree, I think this addresses the question, at least in our minds, can you proceed here without the variance? Uh, it's our understanding in a technical sense that we can shore this up board by board. Again, I'm not politic per se, so I don't know exactly how to say this in a way that is uh, technically right, but 
practically speaking, uh, once we bring everything into variance, we are under some impression that we can proceed. It just becomes a practical impossibility to do so based on the structural deterioration of the building. And this is the part of the conclusion that I think addresses can you do this without the variance. The deficiencies could be remedied by implementing properly designed reinforcement and or resupport of the existing structure. <laughs> However, in our opinion, it would be cost prohibitive to remediate the existing structure compared to raising the existing building and implementing a properly designed and constructed structural system. Furthermore, the efforts required to remediate the deficient structural components would more than likely result in demolition of a large portion of the structure to accommodate the required repairs. That is, essentially constructing a new structure within the existing structure, which would be more difficult and costly to achieve compared to constructing a new structure. If the existing building is remediated, it would be difficult to obtain a finished floor and roof structure that is level, true, and plumb, as it would still contain remnants of the poorly constructed structural components. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, why don't we uh, jump right into uh, the board's comments on uh, the first piece, the uh, landing question cannot yield a reasonable return unless the variance is granted. Is that what you would jump right in? Um, no, I think the same thing. It, it helps to have this structural engineering services report, which basically shows the building pretty much can't support much. So um, definitely want to put that into the record and as our finding of facts because it, really, it gives us a lot of information about the structure and the real viability of redoing it as, a, to, as opposed to kind of building a new structure. Thank you. And again, this being part of the plan of the I think that Mr. Richard? I agree. I echo that. And also, it's, it's, it's obvious that the building is, is not really viable as a business anymore. I've kind of watched its decline in the last few years. It's just too short a season to sustain a, a, a market sandwich shop, general market, or anything like that. And, and to, to, to make it a residence, it's absolutely necessary to, I think, raise a structure that's to me that that's the only choice and to, and to rebuild and I on the record I love it I think it looks great I've always loved going down there and I think it's I'm excited about it I think it's 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 perfect it really is just perfect it's I'm happy to see it when I saw it I was I was so pleased I said that's exactly what that spot deserves and like yeah Bring, bring the lobster roll back, though. They, <laughs> they, they had an unbelievable lobster roll there. <laughs> Sub no, sandwich is what I'm <laughs> Lobster and art. As, a, as, as Mr. Crockett pointed out, it is very useful to have these uh, inspection reports and structural reports submitted to us. I mean, the, the highlights that I take out of this is, you know, trapped moisture, unventilated crawl space, um, uh, leaning pier supports that are in danger of collapse, um, Timber walls currently leading uh, cracks in masonry structure. Masonry walls are experiencing movement due to frost, and especially in an area so close to the ocean where you're worried about salt erosion and erosion in the air, um, to 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 restore this existing structure, as you pointed out, would just not be a very um, it, it's not viable to do. You really need to raise and redo the structure, and uh, I don't have any issue with this application. Thank you. Ms. Shoup? Uh, I agree with the board. I think, you know, you have to do something, and this looks like a really good thing. Um, the only uh, couple of comments I've got on it is, number one, I, I would appreciate in the future, we've had two of them today, which kind of a little bit concerns me, is that we're getting the, plan the, the structural things way too late. Yeah, timing was a, was an issue to try to get to And it happens, I get it, uh, and I don't, don't but I, I know that uh, that's an important piece, so as, again, as we try to educate people as they're doing this, it really should be ahead of time, although I wouldn't hold that against the previous applicant nor this applicant. Um, I do believe that the, the, the property obviously uh, has outlived its usefulness. It's, it's, it's uh, just what it is. I think <coughs> highest and best use is certainly as a residence, 
Um, I think it's the desire to keep its personality uh, says a lot for the app and, and the, the designer. Thank you. And I don't think there's any. Uh, since I haven't seen anything since '71, since I've lived here, uh, where it's been viable. <laughs> it seems to have changed a lot uh, of uses over the years. So I, I feel number one is met easily. So uh, as far as number one is concerned, can I take a, a vote on meeting criteria number one? All in favor? That's unanimous. The criteria. Sure, I just echo your point. It, it makes it a lot easier for us to come into a meeting prepared if we have this. Um, it could make our decision process a lot easier because we do get these things in advance. So if we have these reports coming in, we can see structurally it doesn't look good. So it doesn't help us kind of being prepared for what we're looking at. Um, this is a question from Mr. Longstaff. And, and maybe more importantly, insurance-wise, when you're dealing with floodplains, if this property is above, designed structurally to be above the flood height, does that eliminate the need for flood insurance or you still have to get flood insurance? Do you know? No, it doesn't eliminate the need for flood insurance. It simply makes your premium affordable. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Because you're compliant with the floodplain ordinance. Yeah, and you know, this, this may be a, a just with my experience in that area. This, this may be a good candidate for a letter of map amendment to to actually have the ability to not have that portion of your insurance. It's what the letter of map amendment does. You have to pay a man like Jim Fisher or whoever a surveyor to come in and determine whether it meets. You know, you know if they can successfully remove the property from the floodplain. Is that a Lomar? Are you talking about a Lomar? Is that what? Yeah, Lomar. 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 Yeah. Well, there isn't even an elevation certificate on this right now. Yeah. What, what, well, uh, here's here's the problem with that, though, um, because I can't remember what the new proposed flood elevation was, and I know we probably looked at that, Mr. Gates, but I cannot remember what it was. I believe it was higher. The, the base uh, flood elevation was higher. We did look at it. We looked at it extensively, and uh, and I don't have any. Uh, I mean, I think it's a couple of feet. Yeah. So so the problem with getting Ballpark. a loma is you might get it. You might get it today, but it wouldn't be worth anything when the new map changes come in. So I don't think he can bring in enough fill to get up above. Oh, really? It wouldn't look right. It wouldn't yeah. flow right. So I, I think I think the best bet is to build it in conformance with the floodplain ordinance as it stands today, um, and then I think you'll be grandfathered when the map changes come. I'm not an insurance agent. I didn't even play one on TV, so... <laughs> no, but you were not in there. He, he played one on TV. No, I play one in real life. <laughs> so, um, I don't, I don't I, pretend to know, but I've, I've been told that it, it would receive grandfathered status because it was compliant at the time it was permitted. Yeah, so, I would encourage you to, if there is no elevation stick, to have one done on it because that's going to be a big determining factor to help you. If the bank decides that it's going to be in the floodplain, it's going to be there. They've tried, they've tried putting it in place the last couple of years, and they failed miserably. So that's why it's not in place right now. But it is coming, and just for prudent measures for yourself, I would get an elevation. Well, Mr. Crockett, it because when, if if it is approved and he builds it, he's going to have to get one because it's part of the floodplain permit that okay. he'll have to get. So yeah, so yeah, he'll he'll have that. Yeah, I didn't realize that was yeah. the case, but you definitely want to have that. It makes it that much easier when you do get that request saying that you need to get flood insurance that you can then prove where you are. Th thank you. I, uh, uh, I wasn't expecting to uh, learn even more, uh, and, and I appreciate it. And thank yeah, we I'm, deal with I'm pleased the this is recorded, so I can go back and look at it. And we, can't even, we can't even get a quote for flood insurance without that. It, it's, it's horrible. And it's been delayed the last four, four years now. I think the well, they they put it in place, and everybody's everybody's property was becoming in the flood zone because a bottom part of the property that the house sat 30 feet above, um, one portion of the property sat, which was five feet in the floodplain, so they rezoned the whole thing in the floodplain and jacked people's premiums way up, and people, everybody fought it, but it cost them a couple thousand dollars to fight it, and they all won, more or less. So, and they all had those elevation certificates, which helped them dearly when. This when this happened. Thank you. We'll do that. Okay. So the next one is the, vari the need for the variance is due to the unique circumstance of the property. And uh, why don't we start again with Mr. Crockett? Uh, this property is very unique. <laughs> um, 
Yeah. Well, enough said. We're looking, at, we're looking at the pictures and the rakes and stuff are still inside there on one of these pictures and stuff. What's inside there? It looks like they just like left it and just kind of left everything inside. And so it's, it's definitely a neat property. I don't think it's, it's viable. Oh. Yeah. I mean, it's got a lot of issues that really need to be remedied. But well, Chris Harold made some. Yeah. Uh, I agree. Yeah, lot size. You're right. It's, it's built to skew. Um, yeah, I, I agree. I concur. I admit that. I agree. Uh, you know, come back to the reality that uh, Mr. Longstaff mentioned, and the fact you the parallelogram. This property. Uh, uh, it, I said it earlier, and I'll repeat it. It takes an it takes an artist to sometimes see something that's beautiful, and uh, and make it beautiful. And I, I, a lot of people don't have that vision. Obviously, uh, there's probably a lot of people kicking themselves right now, saying we could have done that, um, because it. Uh, I think it's good. So I, I would agree that it um, is definitely a unique property. Uh, the granite variance will not alter the essential character of the neighborhood. Do you want to vote on that one? Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, all in favor of main number two. Thank you. That's unanimous. Let's come back to number three. The granting of the variance will not alter the essential character of the neighborhood. Scrap it. It can't hurt it. <laughs> uh, the fact that you're putting the sign up there, hopefully you don't get people stopping by to stop at the market. Um, but I, I think that's a great idea. In perceiving the significance of the historical factor of the building, but yeah, it, it's nothing that you do is going to be probably worse than what it's at right now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, I think it's just, I think it's preserving the character of the neighborhood. I think it's, um, yeah, I think it's, it's, a, it's just a gigantic improvement. So, and it's an improvement, but you're keeping it the same. I, I love it. I do. I concur. I agree. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, last item is the uh, oh, 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 thank you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just uh, okay. <laughs> I'll favor of it. Number three. Thank you. Sorry for that. Um, You're gonna get a buzzer and just zap you. And <laughs> 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 the hardship is not a result of an action taken by the applicant or prior owner. I give them chance to be mean with we'll start with the again. No, I mean the prior owners had it as commercial. They tried to use it as commercial. It's not something that's viable down there as commercial any longer. So uh, making it residential, I think, enhances the neighborhood and makes it more in line with what the property probably should have been used for in the first place. I agree. And nothing to add. I agree. Nothing to add. I agree. And again, just going back to the the, uh, the precedent, uh, buying the property does not uh, trigger that regulation that's been case law at this point, so it's moot. But it is fairly recent case law. I don't know how long ago. Yeah. But that's an important thing because I, I know in the past I've seen these things where that has been that has stopped applicants that have come before us. So that's why I bring it up because in the past there were times where that decision to buy said, "Well, you obviously bought it, so you, know, you created it, or the value there." Well, that that's been eliminated as a, as a technical issue, and I think that's really important because, um, as you know, this is an expensive process just to go through the designs and everything else. And um, so, that being said, uh, let's all in favor of four. That's unanimous. And now let's come back to the uh, the primary uh, motion. Do I have a motion? We got it. Um, move to accept application two five six eight. As opposed? As opposed. Second. Okay. So just one other thing on that. Just one quick question. The uh, bottom had a question. You don't intend to use this as a rental property. We can't post conditions on it, but do you, is it your intent to in use it as a rental property? No. Okay. And, Thank you. and just to reiterate, that's not a requirement. Uh, it's just an honest question, but it's an honest question, and and the honest answer is is the simple answer. And if I were to elaborate it would be anything beyond that we haven't even thought of. Great, thanks. And, and I think you had something to long stuff before we vote. Well, actually, I can bring it up at the, at the next appeal. Okay. okay. All right, thank you. Um, so, uh, we have a motion. Do I have a second? Mike, I can Mike, thank you. Any discussion on the motion? 
Seeing none, all in favor? That's unanimous. So we're done part one. Thank you. Thank you. That's the tough one. Uh, thank you. Don't go away. <laughs> <laughs> What I like about this is I don't have to change any of the files on the computer because <laughs> it's keep going, going huh? the same the same property. You getting a break? I'm not going to, to uh, suggest we have a, a break here, but we do have one member that needed to uh, step away for a second, so we'll just slow down a little bit, and I don't want to take a recess because that usually eats up much more time than necessary. to go to the second appeal regarding uh, the trust of uh, Deborah Gates and it's appeal number uh, 2567 it's appeal number 2567 it's a uh, special exception for a, an home occupation and Mr. Longstaff is going to start with on this uh, the proposed plan that's been presented is uh, conforming with regards to the space requirements for a home occupation. Um, and uh, it, again, it would have to meet the, uh, the standards for special exception as well as home occupation, um, which you guys are, are, I think the board is familiar with. We've had several of those. Um, I'll. Uh, I've got one other thing to add, but I, w I would like to defer to Mr. Gates to be able to explain how he intends to operate the home occupation and address your questions first, and then I'll come back to my my question, my my issue, <laughs> if you will. So, uh, oh, pardon. Me. Why don't we start with uh, give you a scope overview of, of the uh, the use, and we'll go from there. Okay. Uh, of the front part of the property. Yeah, you know, the, 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 the front uh, room in the property would be a uh, an art gallery uh, that would be open by appointment. Uh, you would be able to be uh, able to make an appointment. I included this in the application um, on given days of the week from certain hours of the day, but it would not be open. Uh, to passers-by to come in and say, hey, what's going on? We'd like to come in. Uh, so it's open by appointment only. And uh, otherwise, it would be to uh, exhibit my paintings. Uh, occasionally, I work in three dimensions. So it would be sculpture as well, but always artwork. Hmm. And it's as simple as that. Uh, the works would be for sale. Uh, and. Uh, uh, is that? That's perfect. Okay. Absolutely perfect. So why don't we uh, start with the first uh, one? We'll have, I'll read it in and you can read the, your response, okay? Please. Uh, the proposed use will not create unsanitary or unhelpful conditions by reason of sewage disposal, emissions to the air or water, or other aspects of its design or operation. The art gallery will not create public safety problems. No problem created by the occupation of the art gallery will, will require. Am I on the right one? Uh, a, I think. It's the A that you would Pardon me. Pardon me. I apologize. No Thank worries. you. Pardon me. The gallery will not dispose of unsanitary or unhealthful products through the sewage, water, or air. 
The art gallery will have no exterior storage of materials. The gallery will operate in the home, in the room closest to Black Point Road. The home is a total of 1,913 1, square feet. The art gallery space is 381 square feet, slightly less than 20% of the total. The art for sale will be produced or assembled on the premises. Great, thank you. And the second is, or B, the proposed use will not create unsafe vehicular or pedestrian traffic conditions when added to the existing and foreseeable traffic in the vicinity. The art gallery will be open by appointment. There should be no other unscheduled traffic. The standard gallery appointment usually involves a single customer, sometimes a couple. Occasionally, the person, persons making the appointment will want to bring an advisor, such as an interior decorator. In addition to the off-street parking provided to meet the normal requirements of the dwelling, three off-street parking spaces shall be provided for the maximum number of customers that the gallery will allow during peak operation. C is... Okay. I suppose use will not create uh, public safety problems which are substantially different from those created by existing uses in the neighborhood or require a substantially greater degree of municipal fire or police protection than existing uses in the neighborhood. The art gallery will not create public safety problems. No problem created by the occupation of the art gallery will require a substantially greater degree of fire or police protection than are required by existing neighborhood uses. Okay, and the proposed use will not result in sedimentation or erosion uh, or have an adverse effect on the water supplies. The art gallery will have no effect on sedimentation or erosion. Furthermore, the art gallery occupation will have no adverse effect on water supplies. And the proposed use will be compatible with existing uses in the neighborhood with respect to physical size, visual impact, intensity of use, proximity to other structures, and density of development. With respect to physical size, <coughs> visual impact, intensity of use, proximity to other structures, and density of development, the art gallery by design will be compatible with the historic use of the property and with the existing uses in the neighborhood. The art gallery will occupy the site of what has been for over 80 years a historic and nostalgic commercial space, Harmon's Market, later Whitecaps. In fact, the applicants and the art gallery's expressed desire is to maintain the appearance of the former market and to provide the neighborhood with a viable function for the space. Specifically, regarding the visual impact, the Whitecaps Sandwich Shop sign is currently on the building. It is a 25 square foot two feet by one inch by two feet one inch by 12 feet four inches illuminated sign. The significant portion of it is, a significant portion of it is comprised of the Coca-Cola logo for historic and nostalgic reasons as well as maintaining an attractive visual impact. The applicant wants to restore the original Harmon's Market sign and with it replace the current sign. The Harmon sign is 40% smaller, 15 square feet, one foot four inches by 11 feet four inches, and is made of hand-painted wood. Okay. And I, I think that's going to be something that we need to work a little bit around. That's, I think, what Mr. Long says. I appreciate it. Uh, and the shorelands, it's not in the shoreland zone, but it's in a floodplain. floodplain. So it doesn't, the F doesn't apply. G, the applicant has sufficient right title or interest in the purchase of the property. Pardon me, I didn't you hear. You purchased the property, so you have right title and interest. Right, right, right. right. And the applicant has a technical and financial ability to meet the standards of section to comply with any additional imposed requirements set by the board. Which we have no idea what that means. But no, I do because <laughs> I, again, <I've, laughs> I have picked Mr. Longstaff's very generous brain, and uh, and I will read in what I wrote. Which That's I, fine. Uh, the applicant has the technical and financial ability to meet the standards of this section. The applicant understands her responsibility to comply and will comply with any conditions imposed by the Board of Appeals. And the proposed use will be compatible with existing uses in the neighborhood with respect to generation of noise and hours of operation. The proposed use will absolutely be compatible with existing uses in the neighborhood. The art gallery shall generate no nuisance such as offensive noise, vibration, smoke, dust, odors, heat, or glare. The hours of operation are by appointment from 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. Tuesday through Saturday. Thank you. Um, 
a couple of comments. I have the thank you. That's good. Uh, may I add one friendly, just quick sure. thought, Go and that is, uh, Mr. Gray, uh, when I was uh, invited to uh, Howard and Marjorie's house to show them the plans and et cetera, et cetera, in relationship to noise, with uh, did say that he uh, is a very early riser and a very early goer to bed, and we did have a nice conversation about uh, his uh, his procedures that way, and we will do everything that we can to uh, you know accommodate those. Uh, period. Great, thank you. Uh, now this is the second part, which is home occupations. I, I didn't see that in your paperwork. No, these are more uh, this, these are more just uh, responsive type things that, that you can kind of go through just to make sure that he's made, these are the standards for the home occupation. He's are these the ten standards? Yeah. So I, I, I did my best to address them I in, the, it, in the answers here. That's okay. I'll read it in real quick, and we'll, we'll just sure. go from there. Uh, the occupant. The occupation or profession shall be carried on wholly within the principal structure of the, of the building accessory. Yes. Um, the uh, home occupation shall be clearly incidental and secondary in use to the dwelling unit for residential purposes. Absolutely. No more than one person who is not a resident of the dwelling unit shall be employed in the home occupation. Completely understand, yes. Uh, exterior signage shall be permitted in accordance with the home occupation sign provisions under section 12 sign regulation subsection E. Under, I have read those. This is the one that I, if, Mr. Let's Chairman, if I may. Sure. <laughs> this is the one that I wanted to, to bring up because it's sort of a quandary. Um, Mr. Gates wants to restore the original Harmon's Market sign, which as far as I can tell really doesn't have anything to do with the art gallery home occupation. I mean, in other words, it doesn't say Mr. Gates art gallery. It says Harmon's Market. Well, it, it, right, exactly. It, I, my point being this. <laughs> the, the sign requirements in here are, are specifically in reference to the home occupation. And, and that only allows you a six square foot sign that would say art gallery or, you know, what, whatever. My point being that you'd like to mount the Harmon's Market sign, similar to what's shown on the photograph, for nostalgic reasons that have nothing to do with the home occupation. Which is well, I'd, I'd, I'd res very respectfully uh, comment on that. Okay. Uh, and and I. But before you do, maybe I, I just I'm I'm kind of trying to get you an out here. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, so don't don't shoot don't shoot yourself in the foot. Okay. <laughs> I let I let I let him continue to talk first. Good, good. No 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 no. I I just wanted to point that out, and I'll leave it up to the board to 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 debate <laughs> that issue, because in other words, I don't think the board, because of that requirement that was just read, could approve a sign that said Marvin's Art Gallery that was 15 square feet. However. There's already an existing sign on the building. He wishes to restore for nostalgic reasons one that says Harmon's Market. It doesn't say anything about the home occupation. So somewhere in there, my, my problem is I don't know how I can permit this unless it's a condition of an approval by the board. So if we, <laughs> if we said uh, something to the extent that uh, as long as the applicant remains, continues to keep the essence of what was originally there, and that would be the Harren's Market sign, we would be able to approve this. More as a design feature, I think. As a design feature. Yeah. Okay. Uh, because it really doesn't speak, uh, you, you have the right to have a sign that's six square feet that advertises your home occupation. We're saying this is not a sign. Whether or not you feel this does, the Harmon's Market sign does or not, I don't as a lay person out in public don't see the direct correlation. So it's, to me, it's more of a design feature for nostalgic purposes that you wish to kind of keep or actually, um, what's the word? Uh, re re, uh, re establish. Yeah, <laughs> re yeah. kind of reestablish or bring back. And, and Restore. So, yeah, and, <clears throat> and so normally, I, you know, I mean, if, if somebody had an old historic barn, in the rural farm district that had 
some, you know, how they used to paint the big signs on yeah. the barn. You know, you would have the right, I think, to maintain that and restore it if it was faded, even though wall signs are not necessarily that large or not necessarily permitted. This is kind of along those lines, but I don't have a clear path to say yes or no. I do like the Budweiser sign. The Budweiser <laughs> sign. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You should have a Moxie yeah. signed up. If, yeah. if that was still on the building, <laughs> I would buy that from you. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Longstaff? Yes. Could, I mean, I, I have a little bit of a problem with the Harmon's Market sign, too, because I think, I think the Harmon's Market sign is probably going to get people to stop there to think it's a market again. Um, but if you wanted to put something like signifying Harmon's, I don't know if maybe just putting the name Harmon and not saying what it is, You've got an art gallery there. You've got the sign up. I I don't know. Well, I, I'll uh, uh, I'll throw a curve at you as we go along. That's yeah, I, this is kind of a tough one. Let me get through the remainder of these, and then we'll kind of circle around back <coughs> to the whole issue of the signage and and uh, the occupation. Because like I said, mm -hmm. uh, uh, there shall be no exterior display, no. In Exterior store. Am I skipping one here? Nope. No. Nope. Yeah, that's the right one. Yeah, there shall uh, be no exterior display, no exterior uh, storage of materials, no other exterior indication of a home occupation or variation from the residential character of the principal building, except as expressly permitted by the district regu uh, regulations of this ordinance. This prohibition shall not apply to the storage of lobster traps. Yes, I under we understand. Absolutely. I know no nuisance shall be generated, including but not limited to noise, uh, vibration, smoke, dust, odors, heat, or glare. Yes. Uh, the traffic generated by such home occupation shall not increase the volume of traffic so as to create a traffic hazard or disturb the residential character of the immediate neighborhood. Yeah, that's absolutely true. We'd love to do something to prevent people from using it as a turnaround, which is what they do now. Okay. But uh, in addition to the off-street parking uh, provided to meet the normal requirements of the dwelling, uh, adequate off-street parking shall be provided for the vehicles of employees and the vehicles of maximum number of users or customers. And I think you've answered that one. Yes. Your early comments. Um, it's not using more than 20% of the dwelling floor unit. Is that math and done? And uh, uh, no, occupation may... Uh, Include retail sales subject to following limitations. Again, the math has been taken care of on that. And the sale of product is limited to products or articles produced, assembled, or produced. And you're an artist, and so that means that 11 is not applicable and 12 is not applicable. Uh, motor vehicle repairs. And, and so, if anybody has any questions on that, I think Mr. Gates did want to address that, that number four criteria. I kind of okay. I kind of cut him off. There. Good. And I actually, what, what, uh, if you don't mind, what I'd like to do is jump into another thought process with this. I, I, I think there's an inherent challenge with limiting your time to appointment only. Um, I, I think that could create. If people are coming up to your door, and you choose to let them in, are you violating what you got approved by not having a prearranged appointment? I, I think it. I think you'd be better off or better served by us just allowing you to use the property as a home occupation without putting a limitation of by appointment only. It doesn't have to be advertised that way, but... You know, I think we've got the, the, the challenge we've got, this goes with the property. So when this approval is in, it's not with you, it's with the property. And my concern for you down the road is, let, let's say, for instance, that people, you become well-known and uh, all of a sudden, we've got another Winslow Homer uh, kicking around, and people are coming to see you, and you go, sorry, I, I need to make an appointment an hour earlier with you so you can come here uh, to meet what I signed or agreed to. And you get, I just think you're better off saying, it's, this is what it is. It's an art gallery, and how you pick your times is your call. Yeah, I, I just think it, it simplifies it. And then that would also allow you to go one step further with the Harmon's Market, and you could do then a to keep the character and then do again a six foot sign and art gallery um, it kind of accomplishes both things in my opinion allowing for the signage for the historic benefit adding an art gallery which acknowledges what you do or whatever you want to write on there I don't really care 
and opens it up to not limiting you to specific times that are pre-scheduled, which I just think is a nightmare to manage. Uh, you know, closed sign solves that problem, um, but if you choose on a Saturday that's busy and somebody wants to come in and see you and you've got nothing else to do and you want to show, show your work, uh, I don't feel that it's necessarily wise to limit yourself to that. I don't know how the other board well, feel. Uh, well, the chair has already recognized that you've had a conversation with the abutter, and he's kind of given you the times that he'd like to see you not be open. So if you're not, if you're kind of, quote unquote, doing appointment only, but you have normal hours where is what this gentleman would like to see you have, and you can just tell us that you think eight o'clock to four o'clock or whatever, it may be what coincides with what he told you he'd like to see you close so he doesn't have the foot traffic and he can go to bed early. We're, we're generally uh, fine with that and that doesn't limit you because what the chair is trying to present is if we approve this with what you're asking for, it could be kind of a kick in the butt for you. Yeah, it ties, ties our hands and, yeah. and, and I appreciate very much, we appreciate very much your thinking you're thinking much further down the road. I'm attempting to give you a snapshot of what's really going to happen, and and it and 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 of course I appreciate what you're saying and the advice you're giving, and I accept it. Uh, and and what about the concept of the signage? Where I, I would suggest that we let me word this appropriately. I would suggest as part of the requirement of the approval that we maintain the original style of the property by having a Harmon's Market sign uh, the size that's requested in the plan, uh, but adding to it a sign of your choosing that would flow with the, the Harmon sign, letting people know that this is in fact an art gallery of types in that six foot second one by 12, it could be whatever you choose. Um, so I'm sorry, what, is, what are your thoughts on that? One by six is what it is. Well, if you did it that way, I think maybe it would, it could possibly pass the straight face test by, by limiting the art gallery. If well, let me back up. Do we know yet if there's an original sign or is it going to be a replication of the original sign? A no is too strong of a word. I've had since we last talked. I so you haven't verified. I have, and I have not put eyes on it. I've been told again it exists. I mean, that's <laughs> he, he's been told that the original Harmon's Market sign oh, wow. exists somewhere in somebody's barn. We we haven't been able to verify that. It's, but but his intent was if that wasn't the case or if it was too far gone to to use, he would he would actually create a replica of that sign. Okay. Um, so, so if it was a replica, or even if it was the original one, if you felt like, I, I don't even know if you intend to advertise the art gallery with any signage out front. I just don't know what your plans are. You haven't really discussed I can, that I can with briefly uh, tell you what I think sure. or what I, mm -hmm. it, sure. at the appropriate time is now. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, we we discussed this very briefly. Art galleries, and I did a little bit of homework. It's the one piece I hadn't finished my homework on uh, this afternoon, looking up historical famous art galleries in this country. Uh, the most famous one is a gallery known as 291, which introduced artists like Matisse and Picasso to the United States and New York. The gallery's name was 291. It was the uh, we've all seen this and heard this now. It was the address of the building at Fifth Avenue. It had no art gallery involved with it at all. It was just 291. That's the way I view the art gallery signage view of the Harmon's Market sign. Is now obviously. People will drive down the road and say, "May I have a, a lobster roll?" I mean, <laughs> I, in time they won't. And you, and uh, depending on who you talk to, you'd like that time to be right now. I mean, immediately we'd love to have people think it's only an art gallery. If I had my total druthers, and I think I don't want to shoot myself in the foot, You're not. but uh, uh, I think that this gentleman uh, sort of expressed, I think. Uh, the state of my thinking of it standing here right now, which as opposed to having Harmon's Market, it's known as Harmon's. I mean, that's what that's the Prout's next song that they sing at the 
yacht club. Uh, every We're not privy to those secret meetings. Yeah, I know those <laughs> secret meetings. I believe that they, you know, they in it is Harmon's. It's not Harmon's market. Mm -hmm. So if I had my druthers, and I and I'm, I don't mean to be so arrogant, it would the sign would be Harmon's. And then I think it, that solves a lot of issues for you as well. Yeah. So uh, that's and then we don't have any art. It says exactly what everybody who, and I can't speak for everybody, but I think it addresses the historical, the sentimental, the nostalgic uh, side of it and says it. And as long as it's the original or a replica of it, I'm thinking Mr. Longstaff probably wouldn't have a problem with it. Well, I, I think where I would not have a problem is if it was somehow mentioned in the approval by the board. Because <laughs> then I could throw you guys under the bus and I wouldn't have to take the heat. <laughs> and it, it would also, I'll just, it would also be, you know, the sign is about that by 11 feet or whatever you say. It would be as though we chopped off the market. So it would be still that mm -hmm. and down to six and a half feet or something. So it's getting close. I'm not, anyway, you get I like the idea. It's my idea. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. So we've gone through those. So let's come back to... The motion. Uh, there could also be a snow break. To uh, I haven't opened the public hearing on this. So, so let me open the public hearing. There are no letters on this. Sir. No. Let me open the public hearing. Oh. Mr. Gray, would you like to speak again, or are you okay? I'll get over what I said first. Thank you, sir. Anybody else wish to speak on this? I'll close the public hearing. Oh, yep. One more question for the board. Um, just a couple questions for you. Sure, please. Are you on septic or sewer down there? Sewer. Okay. What? With your outwork, you said you were going to be working with three-dimensional. You're probably going to be working with paints and things. What's your method for disposing of the materials? Well, and how I, much are you thinking you're going to have at any given time? It's extraordinarily minor, but the way you dispose of them. And here again, I've done uh, my homework as far as how you dispose of paints in Scarborough. There's a, there are a couple of days a year, and uh, you store in, uh, you know, uh, ANSI standard uh, containers, such things as mineral spirits or old paint, and then on the days that you can take such items to be properly disposed of, that's the way you handle it. Okay. So you've already done your homework on that. That's good because I Scabra has a lot of different intricacies. Yeah, yeah. No, you you don't. Uh, I mean, that's what I meant when I said it doesn't add anything to the water system and that sort of thing I don't it's not something you put down drains um, and that's not to say I only work with oil paints I mean I work with acrylic paints too and those are a little bit harder to control when you're cleaning a brush uh, as you know the water does. You may be working with clay and stuff too. Yeah well no I no okay carving that sort of thing. Hmm. Other questions from the board? So uh, let me throw a motion out there and tell me if it, how you'd like to change it. Yes, sir. Sorry, one more quick question. The applicant has expressed a concern, and I don't know if we can alleviate that for him when we're approving this, of that becoming a turnaround. I don't know how to really solve that, uh, other than... Quick I, ha I have a question. I don't sure. know if this can be addressed or not, and Ted and I have uh, spoken about this just as we're standing outside. And um, and accomplishing it in some way landscape-wise. Uh, That's what I was getting at. But the, the, the trick, of course, is the property as it exists now is five feet fr from the road. Uh, I don't know how to say this simply and it's uh, it, without being too wordy, but um, it would sort of, it would sort of somewhere down the road, I'm just going to say it, uh, require being able to chop up parts of the town's road there and work with the town to, uh, not the real road, but it goes way wide. The right of way. The right of way, uh, where currently, and that for years it's always been, if you've seen a car parked in front of Harmon's, it's on the right of way, it's not on their property uh, or on our property. So it would require whatever going forward we would have to do to enable uh, see, I don't know. I'm just in territory, but it's something that we've thought about about 
how to address the town that so way. In what the you're kind of mentioning sounds like maybe re-establishing some vegetation, uh, a vegetative right, right. buffer along the right of way, right. off the road, but where they normally would have, it's like dirt from the, the edge of the, the pavement to the, the to front the of the store. Front door, yeah. So you would reestablish some landscaping in that area to kind of discourage any turning around. Right, some kind of yeah. curb. or and That's acceptable. Yeah. With, yeah. yeah. Yeah, with a quick call to Mike Shaw and in, in, a, in a sketch, I think that could be handled very easily. So yeah, that may alleviate that problem for you as well. Yeah, every every There's property lots of plants in front of buildings. Every property has that that right of way technically, but people use it and mow it and are responsible for it. Right. And so I don't see it as an issue. Okay, so that's not related to this. No. Okay, thank you. Uh, so I'd like to move that we approve uh, appeal number. Sorry, remember that again? 2567, as requested, uh, with a couple of codicils regarding uh, uh, use and signage. Uh, the first being that the use would be uh, uh, not limited in hours, well, uh, limited in hours from 8 to 4, uh, if the applicant chooses from 8 to 4. Monday through Friday. Well, I have all Does that coincide with what the other gentleman said to you? It, absolutely, and and our conversation was casual and so far as just please try to be not so noisy after six o'clock or something. So, so what I'll do is let me, let me kind of rephrase that as as um, apologize for winging it, but uh, the 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 at home occupation will be used uh, at times uh, at the discretion of the applicant then. Uh, because I don't want to, somebody might want to come over at seven at night. Well, I was going to say, or by, or by appointment, you, you, you could say norm, during normal business, business hours. hours or by appointment. That would be that perfect. That, that yeah. allows an evening visit by two people in one car, which, when, you know, if that happens, it doesn't, you don't have to feel like you're skirting the approval here. Right. Well, one of the things I'm that's noticing, a suggestion. I think it's perfectly worded, and that's what I just Appreciate said. It. And, uh, <laughs> the other is the signage uh, would be uh, bring back or, or keep the, um, the Harmon flavor uh, that uh, I don't want to restrict you on it because I think it's time you may you may shift, but th th it reflects some of the history of what the property was, and leave that to the discretion of our uh, illustrious uh, code enforcement officer to determine. And that would be outside of the scope of the standard two by uh, the standard six foot sign. So that that would be separate from the six foot sign, and I would allow a six foot sign if the applicant so choose. Call it historical aesthetics. Yeah, that's yeah. beautiful. Historical aesthetics, and but again, separate and distinct from the use of a sign. So that gives you the ability to put a sign up if you'd like uh, in the future. Again, this is tied to the property. So we don't want to have you come back for something later on. As we said from the beginning, we, we try to work with people to make it the right answer as opposed to uh, good or bad. And certainly you seem like a gentleman that um, probably follows the rules to a T. Huh. Um, <laughs> that's not necessarily always good. <laughs> so, so we'll leave it at that. And, and that's my motion. Is uh, second. Second. You understand what I'm saying? With that? The, the board understand what I'm saying? Yeah. The applicant understand what I'm saying? Yes, and I appreciate it. Thank okay. you. Do you want to, yes. Mr. Chairman? Do you want to make sure that we've allowed the, if Deborah so wishes to make lobster rolls, we want to be able to. <laughs> <laughs> Just wanted to make sure that was okay. Just, just for the folks at home, that was a thumbs down. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's the motion. As in, uh, do I have a second on that motion? Okay, good. Thanks. Uh, Great. And uh, discussion on the motion. Seeing none on favor, <coughs> that's unanimous. Thank Congratulations. you. Uh, best of luck. Thank you very much. Glad you're, glad you're back and uh, doing something nice for the community. I think it's great. Good to be back. Thank you. Okay, uh, that is the last item on the agenda other than board comments and uh, code enforcement officer comments. I'll let the board comments come. Any comments from the board? Just welcome, uh, Karen. Glad to have you here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, congratulations on your first vote. Yeah, nothing like right? jumping right Wasn't in, right? Expecting that, I'll take it. Uh, anybody else wish to speak, Mr. I love that. You bet. You bet.
want to welcome Mr. Richard back, too. That's right. We <laughs> <laughs> got a short, right. a brief hiatus. After my, my, my sending him a hiatus for a short period of time. <laughs> I, if the board could indulge me for just a second, I've got... Uh, uh, could you do me a favor and just take them folks. outside for us? <laughs> folks? I'll get it. Thanks. Folks, if you could just go outside to talk, we're still we're still on here. You're okay. You already got your approval. Is that much you can do now? <laughs> <laughs> okay. And once in a while, I think it's just well, it's great. Today's been a great meeting. Yeah. Um, um, yes, sir. Yeah. So I I, I had a um, an issue come before me. So I just wanted to propose sort of a theoretical to the board just to get your sense of how you might feel about this particular appeal. The appeal would actually be coming to you next month. It wasn't able to, to get on the agenda for this month. It came in after the, the 20th. But because uh, the situation is that there's a real estate transaction that's a, underway, the house is under contract, uh, a, a problem was discovered during the uh, disclosure phase of the real estate transaction, as happens so often. Um, when examining the file, it was discovered that uh, this particular property had received a limited reduction of yard size variance approval by the board in and around 2003. Um, approximately six months later, a building permit was issued, a little less than six months later, a building permit was issued um, uh, at, for that uh, variance, that limited reduction of, of yard size variance. Th it was issued in error because the variance had not been recorded. Okay, so when you guys approve a variance, as you know, it has to be recorded in the Registry of Deeds uh, within 90 days. By the applicant. By the applicant. And we have to receive proof of that recording. And that was not checked or done. And so the applicant applied for the building permit, built the, it was what amounted to a bulkhead for a f entrance into a foundation, which was slightly over the, the setback line on the property. Um, years have gone by. It's 2016. They want to sell the property. That was discovered. Um, they asked what they could do, and I said, that's a strange case. I don't know. I will consult with the town's attorney. I did, um, and some of the options that were presented included um, the applicant actually coming back to the board for reapproval of a variance that was granted uh, and um, and to see if the board would reapprove that same variance even though the structure had been built after the fact. Um, the problem being, and this is the, the thing that sort of Normally, as, as you guys have probably heard me say, you can't get a variance for something after the fact. You can't, you can't build something and then go get a variance for it. Right. The, the difference here is that the town issued a building permit on which the applicant relied, not understanding or not knowing that, not realizing that the, the variance hadn't been recorded and needed to be recorded. They were issued a building permit. If you're issued a building permit, you're going to build. Right. And so they did, and nothing, it was never picked up. So now we've, we've sort of had a hand in creating this difficulty as, as the town, you know, the town. Mm -hmm. And so one of the recommendations from the attorney, we were, there were three options. The one that the, the applicant would like to pursue is to come for a variance sort of after the fact to um, correct this problem. I just want to know how how you guys feel about something like that if that happens. I haven't mentioned a property. I have not mentioned an owner. So. I'll be candid with you. I personally don't think it should even come back to the board. I think it should be acceptable because of the error of the town. And so I would even we could even vote on it. I suppose if we wanted to. But to me, the issue is it's it's moot. It, the, the, it's, it meets two. It, there's two issues. Number one, the time, the length of time is over 13 years. So to me, the, you, nobody dealt with it in 13 years from the town. Nobody could be too upset about it. Number two, the town gave an, a, a permit um, to retroactively go back 13 years and try and reestablish and rebuild what took place or didn't take place. There are many occasions in the history of our town that we know of, going back a couple, three, 
code enforcement officers ago, maybe even five, whatever you want to pick, that there was some stuff that was sort of dropped off the way. It didn't happen in 2003 necessarily, but there's some history of, of, the, of some sloppiness back earlier. And the town has basically said, okay. I think that sort of applies here personally. I don't, I don't know what our legal rights are or the responsibilities are, but from a practical point of view, I, I don't even see why they'd have to waste the $250. It just are doesn't you, make sense to me. Are you looking at this from a legal standpoint? Because yeah. You can tell it? The, yeah, because I can't, I can't, I can't approve. Um, I can't clear up the file. The, the, the problem is the file isn't whole because the variance never got recorded. Can't the, the, way to, the, way to the way to correct it is to have a recorded variance. Can the manager just do a, a – doesn't the manager have the authority to be able to do a letter of agreement or what is the consent? You can do a consent agreement, but the consent agreement should never – generally never be given to allow a violation. Okay. Mm -hmm. A consent agreement should be given to al to allow someone to correct a violation in a certain time frame. That's you know rather than to say right now, right here, right now, you correct it. We're going to give you six months. We're going to you know you know set set some terms up for it, and to also reduce any penalties for uh, the violation. It should never be a consent agreement is not a, a vehicle to, to, to allow you to buy a violation, basically. There's another tool called a non-action or a no-action letter. That's another, and again, these are the three, these are the three paths that were laid out by the town's attorney to me. His, his suggestion was that reissuing the variance is actually probably the most correct way to go, mm -hmm. although any of the three could potentially resolve the problem. As you probably know, and as I'm sure Ms. Ms. Shoup, Ms. Shoup knows, um, some title attorneys don't want to see a non-action letter. They won't accept a non-action letter. Some some title uh, companies will. So it, it that may or may not resolve the situation. A consent agreement doesn't really resolve the situation. It only it only sets out okay. some t some terms for how it can be dealt and, with. And to be candid with you, the, probably the term I was looking for is non-action okay. agreement. And I, I, I don't know how the board feels, but I would go with a non-action agreement and not even have them come forward. But that's me. I don't know what the other board so members I've, think. So I have a couple questions, Brian. Mm -hmm. um, is it possible, uh, so they apply for the variance, they're granted the variance, they need to be recorded, it did not get recorded. Mm -hmm. And uh, when they apply for the building permit, it was never checked whether it was recorded, and they were issued the permit anyway. So ultimately, right. the, f the person at fault was the uh, applicant who did not record it in the registry of deeds. Mm -hmm. um, it was the error on the town to grant the permit, but the ultimate responsibility was for the applicant. Um, is it possible to just have the applicant uh, record the variance in the registry of deeds now? It as would have to be redated. It would yeah, have to be. You've and got that certain time frame. It's got to be done by. Okay, that's so basically what I'm saying. Okay. I almost think you could do it administratively. It just seems rather to than be. even ha you know even if if we presented the paperwork and the board so chose, I think they could. If if everything was the same, if there were no new issues, the difference being here or the major issue that I'm concerned with is that in, in the case of any variance, there's a public notice element that needs to be upheld. The neighbors need to know that they're, they're coming for this variance, okay? Whether or not they oppose it is ir irrelevant. You guys can still approve or, or deny anything despite how much uh, support or, or um, otherwise there is for it. But it allows them to be heard, and if we just if we don't go through the, the normal channels, and, and we can certainly talk about any kind of um, um, so reduction in, I, and I don't even want to yeah. go. I don't even want to go talk about the fees. If, if we did it, yeah. and let them come before us, we could backdate it to the time frame that no. they needed to have it done by, or no, 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 okay. no, no. You you can't. All you can do is issue a new. Appeal a new approval. You can make them take it out. If you, yeah, we can make them take it out. We have but, a, but, but the problem with that is they got a permit to put it in. 
So you see what I'm saying? A lot, this yeah. this yeah. is the problem. Yes, the ultimate in, in, in primary responsibility was theirs to record the variance. That didn't get done. We're also we also have an obligation to check that we didn't do that. We also you know issued a permit which we shouldn't have done, and we did. So there is some uh, there is definitely some responsibility on the town's part. Um, it doesn't relieve them of that of their responsibility. So there was failure on both sides. Okay. Right. And in this case, then um, we need they need to. I think they would need to have. Um, they would need to be reissued a variance, and if they have to come before us, then they have to come before us. One uh, of the if, questions if, is, this, has this been yeah, well, an action taken you by an owner or prior owner? Well, you, you, you don't want to go down that path. With a limited right. reduction of yard size, one of the criteria is, has construction started? But the response is going to be an honest one. Yes, a permit was issued by the town for this project. That's why it was constructed. So you can, you can use that as part of what you you know you're approving it's the, the, the well, nobody's you, hiding anything you also said though the burden of proof still rested on the applicant to report that but, the, but uh, i mean we, the town erred in in issuing the building that's what i'm saying approved that's what i'm saying so let's carry but who's who's more at fault you know i mean everybody shares in this but i'm just asking you guys what you think about by doing it as a non-action no, actual item, which I've seen a hundred times. I, I cannot tell you the number of times I've seen towns just yeah, go I'm next. Seeing a, shaking in the head down there for the non-action. So. That's okay. But I, I got, we'll talk about that a little bit get on too. But my attitude is, I've seen it a hundred times. It's insured over all the time. It's covered all the time. The question is, does it make it legal again? And the answer would be yes, it does. No, it doesn't. Well, once we say, once we give a non-action, we would say we're not going to... The... The approval of the variance makes it legal. A non-action letter does not make it legal. But it means that there's no change is going to take. We're basically it, saying all the, the town. non-action. Let me be clear. The non-action letter says the town chooses to do nothing about this at this time. It does not waive its right to pursue enforcement action at a later date. It I've never. Seen I've seen well, it, they're wrong because the way it's supposed to be, and you can look it up in the. I main, believe it. I just see them different than that. It's wrong. You cannot. You you never waive the town's rights because the violation exists. You're not saying it's right because it's not. You can't. You'd right. be lying. That's why if you've seen it different, it's a it's not worth the paper it's written on because you can't say something is right if it's not. But you can say we're not going to act on it. You can. That's what I've seen at this time. I, I've seen not the, I've seen the not this time issue yeah. there. Yeah. I've seen that's, that's without that. Yeah. That's I've, I've seen it say we're not going to take action on this. Right. And and sometimes it uses the company with a fifty dollar fine. Yep. I've, I've seen but that. But I don't even believe in the fine because that's just, that's akin to buying the violation. Right. I don't believe you should be able to buy a violation. You're either in violation or you're not. The challenge is, and this is a no-win situation. We we agree with it. We're really violating our own rules. <coughs> we don't agree with it. We're going to end up in court. And there's a, and, there's a, and the reason why they went forward, I think I even know this one to be honest with you. I don't know the names, but if I remember correctly, it was because the basement needed to have an access. It was large enough because there was a bedroom downstairs. I think that was the, the issue, and that's why I'm going by. Well, without discussing the details of it. But the, it, it was something that needed to be done safely. I'm, I'm just throwing it out there as a theoretical. If you were, if you had a case where this was the, the, the variance was issued, it wasn't recorded, a permit was granted, the structure was built, and, and now discovered later that the variance wasn't recorded. I mean, the worst thing that could happen is bring that back to this board. Who's applying? The seller? Mm -hmm. the, right. Yeah, so the they homeowner. Can, so they can sell it. Right. Right, because they need to remedy the problem before they can sell it, or the buyer can buy it with the problem and inherit it. Yeah, that's, that's basically it. So I mean, the future seller, someone buys it now, 10 years later they sell it, they still have the same problem. Unless, unless something happens. No. Uh, if... if Oh, oh! If we do nothing, yeah, right. yeah. The, like the no action letter. But no the, action. Safe. There won't be a future seller because because they can't sell it now. Right. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, does the town feel a responsibility to fix the error? And to me, to fix the error is to follow the process and say we messed up, but you also did too. To you come back, we can't fix it though. Yeah, but it's going to be denied if you try but to bring it back. The do problem. you have to deny it because you're you don't have an to. error by your own employee? Well, technically, it's not that either. It's it's we're talking about a to me we're talking about a a 
technicality that can be blown out of proportion or managed. And I don't, if for 13 years no one's had a problem with it, and it's a technicality that can be cleared with a simple adapt attachment to the deed that eliminates the issue, acknowledges the issue. The people have already heard it because it went before the board, so it's not a matter of disclosure. It's already been disclosed. Mm -hmm. It went before the board, it's already been heard. So the neighbors don't need to be redisclosed. There's, there's, there's an error that took place. Uh, a good example is one neighborhood. Every well, single house is skewed. They're all, every single deed is wrong in one neighborhood. Every deed. Another good example is what happened three years ago over off um, Sawyer Road <laughs> where the gentleman had built the property for the lady but built it outside of the guidelines. And I know you had sent them back to Tom for discussion on that. And I know they were fined. Right. It, but it was That's how it ended. Back. It That's ended with a fine and a, and a non-action letter. So now that's how they did it. I remember that one. But I, I'm just saying, it's a slippery slope once you get once you put the board into a spot where we're going to have to, especially on something as as reasonable as that guy. If it's a variance appeal, it's a little bit different conversation. But we're really talking about limited reduction here. And we're now bending the rules on a limited reduction so we can get past a mistake. I don't think that's good business. I just, I just don't follow that as a, as a, as a sound way. We, we, we've got a problem it's there. We all know it. The answer is we have a problem and it's there. We all know it. So the way you fix it is make it legal. And I think that's something that can be done internally. I don't think it needs to come to this. I would agree with you if it comes back before us, we're denying it. I can do it. I don't need it any other way. I just think it's something that the town can, the town can acknowledge it took place and, and how it's dealt with within the town, to me, is irrelevant. It's, it's, we're talking about a, a technical issue 13 years later. I, I just don't know. I think know. the town's worried about a lawsuit, right, down the line. I mean, you want to protect yourself as much as you can. I'm not really worried about a lawsuit. Well, just that's, the, that's, that's, that's not the point. Idea. The point is that... I guess what I'm having a hard time, I, I understand what you're saying, but what I don't buy is, I've already checked with legal counsel, okay? I don't see any attorneys at the table. I've checked with legal counsel, and he says we can do this. Why aren't we doing it? Well, well you gave me three choices. He gave me three choices. He gave us three choices. One of those is the one I'm presenting to you yeah, today. I don't like that one. And you don't like that one. <laughs> I, like the I, other two. I just want to, if, if you don't like it, that's, I, I mean, that's, what, board. that's well, what I'll do. That's what I'll do. Brian, I don't know if I like that one either. Yeah. Bring it back. Well, for it's the There's board's two call. No it, it's, the, it's the board's <laughs> call. So, so here's, here's, I'll take my position on it. We'll literally take a vote on it. Okay. Uh, I do not you can't believe vote this on. should come forward. <clears throat> this will be a non non binding vote. Straw poll. Yeah. <laughs> I, do, I do not believe that something that is an administrative issue that could that is that could be handled administratively internally through the town manager and the code enforcement office needs to come back this time this specific circumstance. I wouldn't say everyone, but I would say in this specific circumstance, based on what, the fact that you presented. It is not prudent, some president used to use that term, it is not prudent to bring this forward to the board because it's going to put the board in a position that, that is going to compromise its integrity, and I don't think that's a good idea under any circumstances. I would agree. I agree with Mark. What, what would be the circumstances that you would approve that? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think there is one. Are we doing the straw poll? Yeah, let's do a straw poll. I'm in favor of, of not doing it here. <laughs> I'm in favor of doing it here. I mean, I feel it was the problem started with them. They started the problem. Whether any problems happened after that is, is to me, is a moot point. I guess I don't understand. Does oh. Brian, do you have the capacity to fix it internally? Well, there I have the options. capacity to issue a non-action letter. Right. We have the capacity, should the town manager choose to, to do some kind of a consent agreement, but I, I don't see that as a clear path in this case. A non-action letter is really the, the to me, is, I really boil it down to two choices, but, but again, uh, council has given us three, three choices. I can act on a non-action letter. I don't like non-action letters because they don't, in my opinion, do anything. They, they do allow the staff. Title insurance will cover it. <laughs> 
title insurance will, 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 will over. But it doesn't remove the violation, and there shouldn't even be a violation because they got permission to do what they did. Right. But, but that's why I think you can, I, I, I'm not sure you're required, and, I, and this is a legal part, I don't, I don't know, okay? I'll tell you that I've never had, a, I've had numerous cases, you see this in driveways, you see this in shared wells, you see this on setbacks, you see, I've seen it a hundred times, I've been doing it 30 years. I have never seen a lender or a title insurance company deny something that's been given a non-action agreement. I've just never seen it. I've, I've never seen it as an issue. Non-action is, is as good as, if the town is saying we're not going to touch it, mm. no one's going to question it. Yeah, and non-action, uh, I disagree. Non-action is is not good. It may, it might, it might resolve it as far as the title, and of course that's all the sellers really care about. I I don't like them because the violation continues to exist. And that's probably true. Um, but and but that I, violation's there for a future seller. Well, if it doesn't. Once but you, but, but if well, like if it's a future seller, then they come to the board for variance, and they say it's the result of the pri previous owner, and they get. Well, 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 here's here's the difference. In this case, there really isn't a violation other than if if not for the fact that the variance didn't get recorded. It, and, and by doing a non-action letter, it basically says, yeah, you're in violation, but you really weren't because we issued a permit for it. So, so that's, why <laughs> back, that's why I come back to it's an administrative issue. All we care about is that we, we're acknowledging the mistake. There's a mistake that's out there. It, it for all intents and purposes, the non-action letter, yeah, it, there's a precedent in the, in the state. For 30 years that I've been doing this, there's, there's at least 30 years out there, that non-action letters are acceptable. Uh, uh, for, for why don't you? I've never seen one. Do your straw poll. Uh, I think right now it's three to two, but I'm not. Well, positive. it was three to one. I don't think you voted. Uh, you to bring it back three or three to. I, I'm not even saying that you should approve it. I'm just saying should should, should, should the appeal come back? I don't think it should come back. Right now it's three to one that it shouldn't come back. I don't think it should come back. Well, three. To I think if the seller wants, if the seller can sell it with a letter, and the buyer wants to buy it with a letter, and I know it makes Brian cringe. The That's all I needed to yeah. know. I just needed to. I told them that I would bring it up so that they would have some idea of whether or not if they they have any, yeah. anything further to do. If, if they're happy with the letter, then so be it. But let them know that the other option is to come here. In which case, if it would be They're going to run into trouble. Are you changing your vote or are you keeping your vote the way it was? I mean, I'm in the, I'm in the minority, so it doesn't matter. Georgia yes, it does. It matters because, uh, again, I think, I think we, if, you, if that's your opinion, I think it's important to be on record. Yeah, no, I, I, think, I think they should have to get them back. They're a problem to begin with. Yeah. But, so, four to one. Four to one. Violations with the way it looks. And the only reason why I want that to be created is because if this comes up again, there's a, or if this issue. Th there's something on record that we have to discuss. Oh, totally. Yeah, that's fine. He'd still be a I mean, it's... And, and, and truly, I just don't want to put the town... I don't want to put the board in a situation where it's going to no win. Yeah, yeah. And that's my they concern. Did, yeah, and, and it would be tough. It really would, but... It's a no win for us. Never, no, I never... It is. You know, it's too bad. You've gotten no limited reduction in the quarter. I've never I think it's too bad you can do that. It if the town allows you, once the town says, well, should yeah. the town no. require right. proof right. of recording? Yes, we do. You do. Okay. Yeah. It, wasn't, it wasn't checked. That's okay. This that's is, that's what our question is. Yes. Any other comments? Any other motion? Do I have a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. All in favor? Unanimous. Thank you very much. Welcome to the first meeting. Thank you. Have a great night. Thanks a lot. Thanks for bringing it up.